distinguished participants, we would like to welcome you to the first day of our uh, Congress uh, of our Sabri Care Foundation. And we would like to thank you again for listening to our Congress. In uh, nutrition and communication, we will be hosting numerous speakers from Turkey and from abroad. And we will have a two-day program during which we will be talking about nutrition and communication during this pandemic and how we should plan our nutrition. So we will be listening to some valuable pieces of information. Before starting with our program today, uh, let me show you a short video about our past events. distinguished speakers and participants. I would like to welcome you all to the Sabri Care Foundation Nutrition and Health Communication Conference. Today and tomorrow we will be together here with numerous distinguished experts, both from our country and from the world. The information pollution in healthy living and nutrition pose an even greater risk for public health during the pandemic. We will be discussing this issue in detail throughout these two days. Why is scientific knowledge important during the pandemic? What does media literacy mean for the human life? We will try to understand all these issues. The Sabri Care Foundation has been working for 10 years to disseminate accurate and scientific knowledge in nutrition and healthy living to every segment of society. Such an attempt assumes an even greater importance during times of crisis like the pandemic. We now have an even greater responsibility on our shoulders when it comes to share scientific knowledge with society. The nutrition and health communication program that we have been continuing for four years has now been evolved into an international conference. There are numerous projects we have rolled out to fight against information pollution, but nutrition and health communication form the basis of one of our most important programs. As you know, we choose and decide on a health theme for each year and bring communication professionals and medical doctors and scientists as experts in their respective fields around the table and we were looking for a stronger communication and this year on the first day of our conference we will be focusing on nutrition communication during the pandemic during the COVID-19 pandemic the immune system emotional hunger popular diets nutrition literacy Experts in these fields will talk about false facts. And tomorrow we are coming together with world-renowned eminent scientists. How would media literacy contribute to our fight against information pollution? We will make an assessment of the current situation and discuss around possible solutions. The need for an acknowledged organization that would act as a bridge between the scientific world and society as a reliable source of information has now become even more pronounced. It is very easy to access information in our current age. However, 
it is equally difficult to differentiate between what is accurate and what is not. The For Accurate Science platform that we have established to tackle with this challenge, to prevent information pollution and to enable social access to accurate information, enables us to share the most accurate and updated information with the public. We utilize the experts uh, and expertise of our scientific committee members as we share the valuable information we have compiled from internationally acknowledged sources and references. Our foundation has been continuing its activities with the support of our valuable scientific committee members since it was first established. Today, we will have a chance to listen to our distinguished speakers along with some of our scientific committee members. This year is a special year for us. We are celebrating the 10th anniversary of our foundation, which was established to commemorate Sabri Ülkaş, the dawn of Turkish food industry. It is his philosophy of life which defines our mission. Mr. Sabri Hülkay has contributed social development, pioneered numerous projects, and contributed to the establishment of foundations for the well-being of society. Even 70 years ago, he took research and development very seriously. As a foundation, we feel it is our sole duty to continue this mission of Mr. Sabri Hülkay alive. We have worked hard to realize our targets for 10 years and we will be doing so in the future as well. As the only foundation producing scientific information in healthy lifestyle, we are always ready to shoulder responsibility in nutrition and health. As I conclude my words, I'm leaving you with our eminent experts. I would like to extend my thanks first to those scientists who have accepted our invitation and to everyone who is here with us today. I wish you all a very fruitful conference. I hope our conference, enriched with the participation of our distinguished scientists, will contribute to us in overcoming the challenges of the pandemic and in staying healthy. Toplum sağlığının geleceği için bugünden üretmek, bugünden çalışmak ve farkındalık sağlamak. Bilimselliğin önemini anlatmak, sağlıklı yaşam ve beslenme konularında güvenilir bilgilerin topluma ulaşması için çalışmak. Tam 10 yıldır işimiz bu, hedefimiz bu, varoluş nedenimiz bu. Gıda, beslenme ve sağlık alanındaki bilimsel bilgilerin topluma ulaşması için Alanında uzman bilim insanlarından oluşan bağımsız bir bilim kurulunun rehberliğinde başladık çalışmaya. Bundan tam 10 yıl önce. Ulusal ve uluslararası paydaşlarımızla, alanının referans kurumlarıyla işbirliği içinde yeterli, sağlıklı ve dengeli beslenmeyi bir yaşam biçimi olarak görüp, ona ulaşmanın tüm bilimsel yollarını toplumla paylaşmak için 10 yılda onlarca proje gerçekleştirdik. Gelecek sağlıklı nesillerin teminatı, bugünden bilinçlenen çocuklarımız dedik. Yemekte Denge Eğitim Projesi bugün 8. yılında, Türkiye'nin en kapsamlı ve sürdürülebilir dengeli beslenme eğitim projesi olarak fark yarattı. 7 milyona yakın çocuk, ebeveyn ve öğretmene ulaşan projemiz ilkokullarda, Türkiye'nin dört bir yanında çocuklarımıza ulaşıyor. Proje güne her gün, fiziksel aktiviteyle başlayan, dengeli beslenmenin temellerini kavramış çocuklar kazandırıyor ülkemize. Genç bilim insanlarımızın, ülkemizin bilimsel ortamının yeşermesine katkı sunabilmesi için desteğe ihtiyacı var. Sabri Ülker Bilim Ödülü, her yıl bu misyonla düzenleniyor, seçilen projelerin gelişmesine destek sağlıyor. 
Türkiye'nin ilk dijital bilimsel bilgi platformunu dünyanın dört bir yanından uzmanlarla kurduk. Adına Bilim Bunu Konuşuyor platformu dedik. Platform, popüler sağlık konularında bilimin aslında ne söylediğini yazan tek kanal oldu. Türkiye'nin ilk uluslararası akredite beslenme ve sağlık iletişimi programı ile her biri alanında uzman bilim insanları ve iletişimcileri aynı masanın etrafında buluşturuyor. Her sene hem iletişim profesyonellerine hem de tıp öğrencilerine alanında tek olan bu eğitimi sunuyoruz. Harvard Üniversitesi bünyesinde kurulan Sabri Ülker Merkezi'nin bilim dünyasına sunduğu değerli buluş ve bilgileri dünyanın bilgisine taşıyoruz. İki yılda bir düzenlediğimiz Metabolizma ve Yaşam Sempozyumunu Nobel Bilim Ödülü sahibi konuşmacıların katılımıyla bir yıl Türkiye'de, bir yıl Harvard Üniversitesi'nde düzenliyoruz. Güncel sağlık konularının tartışıldığı, alanında uzman isimlerin katılımıyla gerçekleşen Beslenme ve Sağlıklı Yaşam Zirvesi, düzenlediğimiz bir başka önemli etkinlik. Popüler bilim, akademik yayınlar ve çocuk kitaplarıyla, Türkiye ve dünyadan referans örnekleri okuyucularla buluşturan Sabri Ülker Vakfı yayınlarını kurduk. 7'den 70'e okura kitaplarımızla ulaşıyoruz. Kurucumuz merhum Sabri Ülker'in hayat felsefesinden beslenen misyonumuz ve dünya genelinde referans kabul edilen saygın kurumlarla işbirliği içerisinde yürüttüğümüz tüm bu çalışmalarımızın hepsi 10 yıl boyunca önce emekledi, sonra gelişti, şimdi de hepsi Türkiye'de bir ilk olan alanının tek vakıf çatısı altında meyvelerini veriyor. Başardıklarımızdan aldığımız ilhamla çalışacağımız her değerli proje, daha sağlıklı bireylerle, daha sağlıklı bir toplum için. Çünkü yarınlar bizim. Sabri Ülker Vakfı 10 yaşında. During the last 10 years, our foundation has organized numerous events and projects, and we have watched them with uh, great pride. In a minute, we will be listening to our first speaker of our conference from Hacettepe University, a Faculty of Medicine, Department of Infectious Diseases, and the president of the vaccination institution, Professor Serdar Unal. Distinguished uh, President, uh, thank you very much. Uh, dear participants, I hope you can see me and uh, see my presentation. Today we have a technical uh, problem. I, don't, I, I can't see anyone and I'm not sure who is listening to me. So I'm speaking out to the cloud. So please, uh, do, uh, I do apologize for any uh, errors and mistakes. I would like to extend my thanks to Sabri Care Foundations for, for being uh, invited to uh, this meeting. Uh, during the next 25 or 30 minutes, I will be talking about uh, COVID-19 from the perspective of nutrition, infectious diseases and the immune system. So in the world, uh, we have uh, 
microorganisms living all around us from time to time, uh, they can cause pandemics. You can see the viruses and these micro biota. As you can see throughout hundreds of uh, years, the plague has killed uh, millions of people and uh, cholera and then malaria and measles. As you can remember, uh, it has caused the deaths of um, billions of people. And in recent uh, years, uh, we have new infections. Uh, as you can see, between 1940 and 2004, we have had 335 new infections. Uh, these might be animal, uh, they're coming from animals or vectors or uh, from wildlife. In, if you look at the World Health Organization, uh, dated February 2018, the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, the Ebola virus disease and Marburg virus disease, the loss of fever and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, MERS and COVID and uh, Nipah and honey peveril diseases and Rift Valley fever. So COVID-19, was it a surprise? Was it something that uh, we could not uh, expect we need to acknowledge the impact of globalization urbanization it's easier uh, to have transportation and we are losing our rainforests so all these factors result in our uh, be being affected by these viruses So Obama was not a seer. I mean, he made deductions from history and he knew very well about uh, the, the factors around us. This is an old slide, so names might be different. And the names of the countries, uh, we no longer name them after countries. So on this graph, as you move up, you see the fatality rate of the disease. And on the right hand side, you see the infection uh, rate of the virus in question. So we have had this uh, disease in, the his in history. We have had the Spanish flu. Uh, the fatality rate of the coronavirus is lower than Spanish flu, but it is uh, being infected much more rapidly and you can make a comparison between other viruses like MERS, bird flu, Ebola, seasonal flu and common cold. But uh, chickenpox and measles is much more uh, infectious. So what are coronaviruses? I don't want to go into too much detail but it's a group of uh, viruses so uh, we have these S uh, proteins, spike-like structures, which make it look like a crown. And it has, uh, it has got a RNA, which is specific to it. And you see the impact of our flu. So flu is, it, it's uh, different from uh, common uh, flu and common uh, cold. So you have upper respiratory system problems, headache and uh, redness on the nose. But from time to time, perhaps we may not be able to discuss all uh, details, but as the case was in sars cov it is transmitted to human beings uh, through animals. This was what happened in 2003, and it causes uh, pneumonia in uh, people 
and in twelve in twenty twelve we have had this new coronavirus. So these these are the animals, the bat and the pangolin, uh, from which we we have had the coronavirus in Wuhan in China. People have consumed these animals, and because the climate uh, conditions were favorable and it was a crowded place and there were uh, numerous other uh, factors that's why we have had this virus uh, coming out of this country so uh, the previous diseases the pandemics have had similar symptoms like headache uh, fever from a systemic perspective dry cough pneumonia and lower respiratory tract infection, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and muscle pain and joint pain, and uh, the coagulation, the systemic inflammation, uh, which causes the venous system. And this is such a disease that if 100 uh, people gets infected, 85% of uh, those people are uh, asymptomatic without any symptoms and 15 of them uh, have to be hospitalized. From the very first day of the outbreak, as we know, uh, at the end of December when uh, we have seen the first cases in China uh, from the fish market, and as end of uh, December, they have reported the World Health Organization and the disease was followed uh, by World Health Organization and it spread uh, throughout the world and it, it has turned into a pandemic. During the first days, well, there were a number of discussions like whether this was consciously uh, done by China and we have had uh, heated discussions around the world and now it's all around the world it was not a bad cooperation. Uh, Mr. Obama's uh, speech that focused on solidarity and collaboration has uh, proven uh, fruitful. So we have very quickly learned using the PCR tests. So it's uh, painful if you do it on the nose. So we try to use the saliva for uh, testing. And then we had uh, an antibody uh, response. And then we started differentiating between those with an antibody and those without it. Sometimes we use it for protection and from time to time uh, we have um, antibody uh, scans and PCR tests carried out by the Ministry of Health. And after this, this the world has focused on uh, the potential treatment of COVID-19. So we, know, we now know a lot about it. The disease has a preliminary phase, a viral response rate, and then a host inflammatory response phase. Well, it uh, affects the immune system to the extent that it causes a hyperinflammation. And we now know a lot about the symptoms that are observed in different phases of the disease, like clinical symptoms and clinical signs. So we have said that it uh, affects uh, coagulation. It's a, uh, dextamethasone is used. Uh, it's a cortisone and uh, oxygeni oxygenization is affected. So oxygen is used for the treatment and we know at what stage all these treatments should be used uh, when a person is diagnosed with COVID-19. And then we have had this interleukins and in intermediary uh, molecules, if you like, and uh, th these uh, drugs block the functionality and antibody of, of antibodies of these uh, viruses. So we have uh, an, a number of different drugs. We have already known about uh, these, but in due time uh, we have understood that they are not sufficient for treatment. And later on we have had to treat the fungal uh, infections so it was a very long journey starting from China. So all the world has worked on it. We did what we can, but we, we were not successful. So these are the uh, reports uh, that I have taken from the internet from this morning. So 55 million uh, total cases globally. 
So we have uh, 170 people uh, dying out of 1 million people around the world. It has started in the North uh, Hemisphere and spread to the South. So the United States could not stop uh, what, whatever they did. Uh, 11 million and 252,000 deaths. India, 8.8, .8, but 94 uh, deaths per million. So we, we really try to understand why the figures are different from one country to another, uh, or uh, are we talking about different perspectives? Today, I don't have much time to talk about it, but uh, different perspectives might affect the death rate, the fatality rate of the disease. So in Turkey, our uh, fatality rate is 137 per million, uh, 11,600 total deaths. So it's uh, lower than uh, the ones uh, upper in the list with higher figures. Why couldn't we stop it? Actually, we have two dimensions, uh, the use of uh, masks and social distancing. Other than a few uh, countries, uh, no single country in the world uh, could uh, manage this process effectively. That's why the, the, the pandemic is uh, being spread. So the closing down of restaurants and schools and flexible working hours, and at the in the end, I mean, um, limited uh, lockdowns are on the weekends or uh, during the weekdays. So despite all these measures, we could not um, win our fight against COVID-19. Health professionals are affected hugely by what's going on. We really feel for them. And the death rate among health professionals is also very high. So where are we heading towards uh, COVID-19? The uh, course of the disease might be affected by of the mutation of the virus as the viruses grandmother and grandfather have gone through the virus might go into a kind of mutation but at the moment we do not have such an expectation and the virus is very much alive in time everyone will get the disease uh, those who will die will die and others will be immune to the virus which is called a herd immunity, but herd immunity as a concept is rather complicated because it's not that easy to have a herd immunity. We need to have uh, the formation of our antibodies in 60% of the population so that we could talk about herd immunity at all. And a prophylaxis or an efficient treatment, I mean, uh, we could find such a drug or a that we can uh, deliver it before the disease and prevent deaths, but we do not have any developments in that area either. And uh, either we might have an efficient vaccine. So projects on vaccination are still going on. You see it very frequently as of January, we have gone uh, into a kind of race. This is um, a marathon, if you like, some countries have started uh, into this marathon uh, earlier than others. Uh, pharmaceuticals who, who, that have developed uh, vaccines and drugs against uh, uh, SARS and uh, COVID or pharmaceuticals that have been working on uh, coronaviruses for a long time have uh, focused on their vaccination projects. I will be showing you it uh, in one of my next slides. So it's not like uh, an adjuvant uh, therapy. I mean, we are not talking about classical vaccination projects, uh, non-replicating uh, viral vectors and replicating viral uh, vectors, uh, live uh, attenuated and protein RNA and uh, DNA. Uh, studies. So we have uh, new methods uh, being worked on uh, very quickly. So in this race, we have uh, different groups uh, soon. Uh, so 
So at the moment, we are we have a uh, fifty five uh, vaccination projects, and at least eighty five of uh, vaccines are in preclinical phase, because it's not easy to uh, carry it out, and it takes time, of course. First, we need to have the preclinical uh, lab uh, tests, and then uh, we will uh, try on animals and uh, phase uh, three. And with phase uh, three, we will have licensing. And during the licensing period, uh, you know, uh, in the world, we have uh, 12 uh, vaccination in phase three. Six of them have been approved for early or limited uh, use. So we do not have a licensed uh, vaccine at the moment. So approaches to COVID-19 uh, vaccine development. So we have antibodies. And today we are discussing around uh, RNA uh, vaccines, messenger uh, RNAs. This is part of the nuclear nucleated uh, acid. And it is a process called uh, electroporation. So it sits on the location where we have the code and then the synthesis uh, occurs and uh, an immune response is uh, formed. RNA and uh, DNA, these are similar to one another, and it's not the only case, actually. So we have uh, lipid uh, capsules, uh, actually you can use nanotechnology to deliver it to human beings. So we have numerous vaccination projects that goes on like this. Sinovac uh, China, it's an inactive uh, vaccine. The phase three goes on in Turkey. BioNTech uh, Pfizer, And we have other uh, vaccines as well. So we have uh, vaccination projects in Turkey as well. This year in April and in May, we will have phase three uh, trials. Vaccinations, well, this is a hope. And it looks like this pandemic will be prevented uh, through a uh, vaccine. So this was like a long introduction and let me uh, talk a bit about nutrition and the immune system. Uh, masking and hygiene uh, and fighting against uh, respiratory symptoms. These are important issues. And if we block that, and if we put a distance, and also block the entrance to the counterpart, then we can prevent uh, like 90% or, oh, and then, you know, we, we just touch our face and nose, and then, you know, we use hand disinfectants, and, you know, alcohol kills the virus quickly. Well, it is easy to to, to control but then it's difficult to do it every day but well the, the, the, these are the core um, uh, measures but then, then there are other factors like when when when when the virus enters to our body in our uh, mouth and uh, nose we, we don't want it to proliferate we want to control it and if it proliferates and we would like to decrease the severity of, of, of the disease and, and we have a system for it it's called the immune system the system you know anything like uh, fungus uh, parasites viruses any pathogens are defended in our body uh, you know by, by the immune system and, and we have a fantastic system it is a cellular system like this is the virus and this is the uh, epithelial cell and and it is done by ACE2 receptors the S protein it attaches to the ACE2 receptor and then and penetrates the cell
and then it sends signals and the immune system uh, is triggered. These are macro macrophage uh, and they process and then they, they and then T and B lymphocytes are introduced and then plasma cells and B cells generate the an antibodies and then the T cells uh, generate the killer T cells and they our immune system fights against slowing down or stopping the disease. S very similar things happen uh, during a corona infection. You know, people are discussing gen gen uh, the, gen gen the genotypes and there is one type 1 uh, IFN uh, if this uh, if this intermediary um, matter interferes early, activates early, then then then then then then, then, then there will be low virus uh, titer. But it but it but if not, then there will be more activation. So our immune system is activated quickly against the SARS virus. But our immune system is active 24 by 7. It constantly scans the body, and it, and it is even further activated when there's uh, more serious uh, conditions. And it, it, it tries to accommodate the heightened activity, and then requires energy sources and substrates uh, to. And and all these things can be gen can be f provided by our diet. And today we know that our immune system is directly uh, related with the infections. An immune system is supported by our diet by nutrition. So it's it's like a circle. So our in inf inf infections activate the immune system, but then the immune system is supported by uh, by nutrition. The nutrition system and uh, immune system are partners, and they fight against the infections together. And and we know that vitamin A, B6, B, B12, folate, C, D, and vitamin E are crucial. Zinc, copper, selenium, and iron have key roles in supporting the human immune system. They synthesize uh, core elements. They generate signaling material. Yeah, these, these are all proven facts. And, and not only for infectious diseases, but also for COVID-19, uh, these facts apply. Well, this is by Calder. Uh, it was published in Nutrition and Medical Journal. I, I recommend this article because I, I borrowed most of my uh, speech from that article. When, when there is vitamin A deficiency, there's an increased incidence of uh, respiratory diseases. Vitamin C has been studied a lot. There, there's a question mark on its, its, its pro, pro, pro protection for the upper respiratory tract infections, but then there are some studies uh, that when there is pneumonia, vitamin C is uh, eff effective. Vitamin D uh, decreases the risk of respiratory tract infections. Vitamin D is very popular lately. People treat it like hormone. Its positive relation with the respiratory tract has been proven, and I mean, I, I haven't I haven't brought all my slides, but I, I'm sure the next speakers will will further discuss this. And when there is a vitamin D replacement, the prognosis of COVID-19 patients will be will be improved. Same applies to zinc, copper, and iron. Uh, especially for uh, children uh, having pneumonia, they they support uh, the immune system, and not only that, but immune system directly affects our, our microbiota, and and healthy microbiota is like a school, uh, benefiting the immune system.
and our uh, and this and this all depends on how we eat and dine and it's, it's all about our diet there are, there are proven relations between uh, diets and bacteria uh, i mean the, the my, my microbiota i mean i don't have time to individually discuss all these findings but kids and adults when when uh, the microbiota is optimum or when, it, when supported by probiotics a number of infectious diseases, including respiratory tract diseases, and I believe corona is also involved. It will uh, help the prognosis and recovery. There are so many studies on this about upper or general respiratory tract infections. My last topic would be is when the cytokine storm starts. Uh, we have ARDS, that is acu acute respiratory distress syndrome. That means our lungs uh, lose their functions and it, it leads to a very high rate of mortality. That means high inflammation and the, the term is cytokine storm for this. And there's a number of studies that show that N3 fatty acids have... Uh, a kind that uh, they, they, they will be slowing down and mediating uh, the cytokine storm and supporting these f f fatty acids uh, may be slowing down the ARDS. There, there are studies on this. This is a meta-analysis. Uh, the oxygen sat saturation rates, number of days in ventilation, uh, other organ uh, risks and 28-day mortality. You see the p-values. Uh, on on some of them, it's it's the, the positive effect is statistically significant. Especially, it reduces days in ventilation by two and a half days. Days in intensive care is reduced by three days. It's all about N3 fatty acid rich formulas. Dear colleagues. Corona is a bit bitter storm for the entire world, and we should always uh, use the mask and hygiene. The vaccine is a big hope. We've been discussing this all along, but we may be neglecting our uh, healthy diet and and, he and healthy living conditions, like exercising regularly, like walking half an hour fast, uh, having a regular sleep. And above all, a healthy and balanced nutrition is key to a healthy life because a healthy body will have a healthy immune system and a good functioning immune system will be resilient to any disease, including uh, COVID-19. Uh, that's all I want to say uh, for the time being. If, if you have any questions, I would be delighted to answer. But if not, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for this beautiful speech and sharing your thoughts. Our agenda will continue with the speech of Dr. Julian, the, the, the member of uh, Sabri Ukash Foundation, uh, the scientific committee. Well, uh, Dr. Julian chairs to a number of nutri nutrition boards, like he is also a, an academic member of Royal Society of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Julian, the floor is yours.
good night and and uh, good morning from England, where it still seems like the the middle of the night. I'm proud to have been a member of the science committee of the Sabriorca Foundation since the very beginning, more than ten years ago now, and I'm looking forward to the time when I can be with my friends again in beautiful Istanbul. In the meantime, I'll do my best to communicate with you using the available technology. And I would like to thank the team for helping me to get online. I hope it's working. The title of my presentation this morning is Understanding the Science, Distinguishing Between Fact and Fiction During the Pandemic. But I want to emphasize right at the beginning that I'm not a virologist, and nor am I an expert in COVID-19 as such. So my presentation this morning will be from the perspective of a scientist normally engaged in nutrition science and food legislation. However, I do believe that the same principles apply across the scientific spectrum. So the agenda for my presentation, firstly to focus on the headlines and underline the need for clear and accurate information to be communicated to everyone. Then I will consider the hierarchy of scientific evidence and give some examples which relate to COVID-19. I'll then uh, give you some suggestions for the source of accurate and relevant information on this subject and make a few concluding remarks of my own. So here we have um, an announcement from the White House itself, an official announcement that President Trump's coronavirus response has saved over 2 million lives and outperformed other nations. I'll come back to the whys and wherefores of that, how accurate it is. But this is the sort of headlines that we're faced with on a daily basis. And there was a book published earlier on in the year called The Great British Coronavirus Hoax, where the author suggests that we are being forced into having digital identity and mandatory vaccination when the pandemic isn't really anything more serious than normal flu. I see uh, the COVID-19 paradigm in this way. Um, it's a balance between science and politics between public health and economics. And of course, it's a, a complex interaction between all of these aspects. The politicians in the UK particularly emphasize that they are basing their strategy on the available science. The World Health Organization keeps a daily dashboard to explain the spread of the pandemic and here we are at the 3rd of November with 1.2 million deaths reported to the WHO and as of the 15th of November it was 1.3 million so an extra 100,000 deaths in less than two weeks. So what science do we have surrounding coronavirus? The pandemic is new, it's less than a year old, and science usually takes some time to develop. But scientists have, have to work quickly in this case. I'm indebted to the European Food Information Council for providing an infographic which gives a hierarchy of scientific evidence. And I'm going to use that as a framework for describing the different types of science available for COVID-19. This infographic is available from the website of UFIC in Turkish and a number of other languages as well as English. At the top of the hierarchy is the systematic review and meta-analysis. The systematic review and meta-analysis takes into account the totality 
of information available on a particular subject. Criteria for inclusion in the systematic analysis are agreed in advance, and then two independent groups will mine through the data available. Each study is given a weighting in the review, depending on the, the power of the study, depending on the potential for bias. And then the two individual groups come together to see whether they agree, and if not, they have another go. And this is then um, turned into a meta-analysis, and the forest prop plot is the best outcome of a, a meta-analysis. The Cochrane Library, uh, based in Cambridge in the UK, is famous for its systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And it normally takes some years to put together a systematic review. But Cochrane have taken the view that in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, they need to be rapid with providing information. So they now have a, a rapid review system. One example here is the review of the data on quarantine. And they considered quarantine on its own or in combination with other public health measures to control COVID-19. And their conclusion was that there is limited evidence, but all the studies found quarantine to be important in reducing the number of people infected and the number of deaths. And quarantine was more effective uh, when it started earlier and was combined with other prevention and control measures. We then come to the next level of information, which is the randomized controlled trial. This is a study where two groups of people are selected and one group receives the therapy whilst the other group receives a placebo. And some of these trials are double-blinded, which means that neither the investigators nor the subjects know whether they are receiving the treatment or the placebo. A good example of this study has been the solidarity clinical trial for different therapeutic agents which has been coordinated by the World Health Organization. And to date, it involves almost 12,000 patients in 500 hospital sites in over 30 countries. And the objective of the study has been and is to evaluate the effect of various therapeutic agents on three important outcomes, which are mortality, the need for assisted ventilation and the duration of hospital stays for COVID-19 patients. The interim results were published on the 15th of October and unfortunately, none of the treatments evaluated had any effect on overall mortality initiation of ventilation or duration of hospital stay in hospitalized patients. Three of these were antiviral agents already on the market, and the fourth was hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malarial uh, therapy. The trial is now considering evaluating other treatments, continuing to search for an effective therapeutic for COVID-19. But so far, only corticosteroids have proven effective against severe and critical COVID-19, and they are um, active in reducing uh, the overactive effect of the immune system on lung function. And they've dis discontinued two of the treatments already. And I've been following the uh, development of the Oxford vaccine um, here in the UK. 
And this also has been the subject of um, an extensive intervention study. The Oxford vaccine works on a traditional basis. It uses an inactive virus uh, isolated from chimpanzee, an adenovirus, and then the genetic material for the protein spike of the COVID-19 has been cloned into the inactive virus. And then the virus with the cloned mRNA is injected into subjects as the um, immunization. And this induces the protein to be produced in humans and that triggers an immune response. It's a traditional vaccine. There are six steps in the development of such a vaccine. Firstly, the basic understanding of the virus, and indeed the uh, molecular structure of the virus has been elucidated in full. Then uh, various candidates are selected, preclinical testing undertaken in animal systems, and then clinical trials in humans. And there are three steps with increasing numbers of subjects and phase two and phase three are involving um, extensive um, evaluation of efficacy and safety of the vaccine. After the efficacy and safety have been proven, then the data are submitted to the regulatory authorities for approval. And in the case of the Oxford vaccine, there's been a well-publicized collaboration with AstraZeneca, such that as and when the, the vaccine is found to be effective and safe and has been given approval, then the vaccine will be ready to administer to subjects. And I was thinking that this is probably the most developed of the vaccine candidates until last week, Pfizer and BioNTech announced that their candidate had achieved dramatic success in its the first interim analysis from the phase three subject study. They involved almost 44 subjects and they identified 94 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the trial participants. And the vaccine was 90% effective in preventing the development of the infection. That is an amazingly positive result. And the history of the development of this vaccine is, is fascinating. A Turkish-German couple who lived very modestly in Mainz in Germany developed what is a, an absolutely novel type of vaccine, and it's based on messenger RNA. Again, it's the mRNA coding for the spike protein of the COVID-19 that is injected directly into humans in a lipid nanoparticle. And similarly, it um, stimulates the production of an immune response, antibodies and T cells. So the early results bode really well for approval of a vaccine this year. If you look at the press release from Pfizer, you can uh, follow a link to the protocol for the study, which runs into, I believe it's over 160 pages and um, quite unintelligible to the lay person, but it's a very thorough piece of work. I've listed here some key points about this vaccine and some questions that are outstanding. Firstly, to emphasize that a 
success rate is an outstanding result. The most anyone had hoped for was 40 or 50 percent. But we are indeed awaiting publication of the clinical study data. And many, many scientists are active online, eagerly awaiting the data. And it's very clear that regulatory authorities will not compromise and approval will only be given when proven safety and efficacy data are provided. There's no reason to think that these data will not be provided. Pfizer has announced that 50 million doses will be produced globally by the end of 2020, some in Europe and some in the USA, and 1.3 billion by the end of 2021. The experts advise against a combined vaccine administration. This is a question that often arises. Should there be a combination, for example, of the Oxford vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine? The problem is that the evaluation has not been undertaken on this combination. So the safety of the combination is not proven. And also, Scientists want to get to the bottom of which is the most effective uh, therapy. So how does the vaccine protect against serious cases? The study was performed on healthy individuals, although 42% of those did have underlying health conditions and were from diverse backgrounds. And does the vaccine present, prevent transmission of the virus or just lack of expression in the particular subject that's been vaccinated? It's an important question. Can we hope to eradicate the pandemic um, with the vaccine? Does it perform differently in different age groups? And we haven't seen the data on this, um, but the study uh, involved subjects from 12 years old to 85 years old. So I'm questioning how relevant it would be for my 95-year-old mother, for example. How does it perform in compromised individuals? How long does the immunity last? We don't know that yet, but the study is continuing. But the Achilles heel of this vaccine is the need for ultra-cold chain distribution, minus 75 degrees Celsius, which is going to be an enormous challenge for healthcare professionals, particularly in countries that hardly even boast uh, refrigerated storage. The Oxford vaccine can be um, stored under normal conditions and will last for six months at uh, minus 20. So I was thinking this would be the last I had to say on the vaccine. And then yesterday, yet another COVID vaccine has shown remarkable positive results. Moderna um, from Massachusetts um, have published interim results of a phase three clinical study involving 30,000 subjects. And they identified 95 cases of COVID-19. 90 of these were in the placebo and five in vaccinated subjects. So this, of course, is almost a 95% protection. There were 11 severe cases, none in the vaccinated population. This is also an MRA-based vaccine. I think the point here is that there is room for all of these vaccines and everyone working on the vaccines should be greatly encouraged by the results we've got so far. The Oxford team, for example, have commented very positively on the, on the Pfizer vaccine because it gives some confidence that their own approach is likely to be successful as well. Moving down the hierarchy of evidence, we come to observational research. Uh, there are two basic types of study, and I've used here a different example just to explain what I mean. There are two types of observational study or epidemiological study. 
there's a retrospective study looking at all events that have already happened and prospective study looking at events that may happen in the future. And this is the basis for the association that has been elucidated between smoking and lung cancer. The case control study looks back at a group with lung cancer compared with a paired group who don't have lung cancer. The case series study just looks at the group who have lung cancer and tries to establish possible causes. A cohort study would study two groups paired for similar behaviour, except that one smokes and the other doesn't. But this would be expensive and long term and could be considered unethical if it's thought that smoking does indeed impair health. But um, this is history, but the same techniques are being employed to investigate COVID-19. Imperial College London is a centre of excellence on COVID research. And here is a study that was undertaken on over 365,000 people in England. And what that showed was that antibody response to the virus has decreased by about 26% since the summer and the end of September. It's not clear what the relevance of these findings are because it isn't clear how the antibodies may provide immunity from the virus. But this is a, a type of observational study that um, is useful in supplementing the evidence from intervention studies. Animal and cell studies I've alluded to briefly in the um, early stages of the vaccine production. And then we come to individual opinions and anecdotes. And these are the ones that uh, make the uh, media headlines. And there's no one has been more vociferous on COVID-19 than dear President Donald Trump. And uh, he, the Guardian has kindly recapped some of the statements he made about COVID-19, very much under control in the USA. Um, the risk to American people remains very low. Um, this, of course, goes back to February, and he thinks it will disappear, fading away without any problems. But, of course, the US has the highest number of deaths of any country in the world. He doesn't think he'll be wearing a mask. Uh, Joe Biden wears a mask, but he doesn't want to be associated with that sort of behavior. And he's thinking maybe injection with a disinfectant would help because um, disinfectants will knock out the virus in a minute. And if you inject it inside, maybe it'll clean the body. Um, and what about ultraviolet or another powerful light being put inside the body? Goodness me. These are just some examples of what Donald Trump has said. He wants to play down the pandemic because he doesn't want to create a panic. And uh, it's mainly completely harmless. Um, I wonder what he's saying about that now. Well, what he's saying, and I come back to the original slide, that he saved two million lives. And uh, PolitiFact Health Check is an independent group in the US that will check the validity of um, public health uh, statements and pronouncements. And here it says it's mostly false, not entirely false. It's based on a publication from March um, from Imperial College. Neil Ferguson, uh, one of the government's advisory committees. Um, and he predicts that without any mitigation or intervention or any action, then the US will suffer from 2.2 million deaths, the UK half a million. But of course, there has been mitigation. And um, so the 200,000 deaths represent a, a saving of two million. That's where Donald Trump gets his numbers from. When Neil Ferguson was asked about this, 
he said, well, of course, it's nonsense because the pandemic is not yet over. Had it been over, then maybe the actions would have saved two million lives, but we don't know where it's going to end up. There are still people out there who think the coronavirus is a hoax and it's designed to help control the population. Reuters, a very respected news agency, have done some fact checks on a couple of videos circulating in the UK. And of course, it's utter, utter nonsense and shouldn't be taken seriously. And people who think that it's a hoax should be counseled against their ideas. Here we have a, a slide from the uh, Public Health England showing that up to the end of October, there were 55,000 excess deaths in the UK compared to what would be expected over the same time period. The skeptics would say, well, that's because everyone was focusing on COVID-19 and people who had um, acute issues, cancer, etc., were ignored. That isn't really the case. So just quickly, um, four sources of accurate and relevant information I would encourage you to um, access. The World Health Organization, the UK government's scientific advisory group for emergencies, the Cochrane Library, and the Royal Society of Medicine. I'll say a few words about the first three. The Royal Society of Medicine runs a series of webinars on COVID-19. And as of last Thursday, they um, had run 50 of these webinars. And there's a very compelling webinar on the vaccine that I would commend to you. Don't forget that we have to rely on peer-reviewed science. That science that is published following a, an independent review by experts in the field. We're lacking peer-reviewed science on COVID-19 because it, because it is so new. But all those serious scientists working in the field are actively preparing papers for publication in peer-reviewed journals. World Health Organization, a wealth of information on COVID-19 despite not being supported by Donald Trump. And a lot of myths have been <laughs> evaluated. And each of these, and there are other examples, has been the subject of detailed investigation by the World Health Organization. And their conclusions are available on the uh, World Health Organization COVID-19 website. The UK government, has been advised by their scientific advisory group for emergencies, some very eminent scientists there. They've run 60 meetings, not 60 minutes, but that's the minutes of the 60th meeting. And they are cautiously offering key points to advise the government and there's no evidence so far that the current viral variants are more or less virulent than previously circulating strains. But whether that will be modified when they look at the um, virus from the mink is another matter. The Cochrane Library, which, as I mentioned earlier, is focused on systematic reviews and meta analyses, has a database of studies on COVID-19 and I've counted 26,210 studies registered in their database and this is where you'll find as much information as you can possibly assimilate on COVID-19 and the science that is currently in progress. So I just want to conclude by making a few remarks of my own here. Firstly, it's very important that all activities and communications on COVID-19 should be based on sound science. There is no room for the personal 
anecdote, particularly when the perpetrator has absolutely no understanding of the underlying science. And we all have a responsibility to make sure that the pub public is accurately and clearly informed because it's easy for us to be misled and to panic. We need to check the evidence, what studies have been performed, where do they fit in with the hierarchy of scientific evidence, are there any peer-reviewed papers, there soon will be, and we have to communicate a balanced perspective on the science, and I hope that's what I've been trying to do this morning. But science isn't perfect, informed judgment is necessary, and opinions change as new science emerges. Um, overcoming this pandemic is going to require science and society working together, and international collaboration is essential. And I think the work that's been done so far is an unbelievable example of why science needs continued funding, why it's important, and why international collaboration is essential. And nationalism is not, it doesn't have a place in this. And I think the announcement of an effective vaccine is truly an exciting, positive development. And with that positive note, I'll conclude. And um, thank you very much for listening. Teshika. Well, hello everyone. Uh, we will be listening to another eminent speaker of ours from Istanbul University Experimental Medical Research Institute Diabetes Research and Application Institution President and also the President of the Turkish Diabetes uh, Foundation, Professor Temel Yilmaz will be with us today. Professor uh, Yilmaz uh, at the Experimental uh, Diabetes and Research Institution carries out research on diabetes and uh, he is also working for the Ministry of Health. Yes, the floor is yours. Uh, sevgili Sayan, çok teşekkür ederim. Herkese 
Ee, i̇yi günler well, diliyorum. Thank you very much ee, for the introduction. I wish everyone a very good day. Aslında Demiroğlu Bilim uh, Üniversitesi diyabet araştırmaları ve uygulamaları, well, uh, uygulamaları this, uh, bölümünde bir institution uh, I work for the Diabetes Research and Research Institution at the University. Covid-19. Covid-19. Aslında. So there was a technical problem. We do apologize. Yes, the floor Aslında is once again yours. Sizden olmadı benim bilgisayarımdan oldu. Actually, Amerikan bilgisayarı. The problem was my computer not oldu. from your side. Herkese oh, tekrar iyi günler diliyorum. US. So a technical problem arose from my computer. I do apologize. So hello everyone once again. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as you know, uh, it affects all the world negatively. Mostly. Aslında diyabetliler. Actually, the diabetes. Uh, uh, bizim ülkemizde de 12 milyon uh, was affected largely, uh, and in our country we talk about uh, 12 uh, million diabetic uh, people. Sosyal güvenlik kurumunun This is data from the Social Security Foundation and the Ministry of Health in our country. We have a valuable data. So we have 8.5 million people on drugs for diabetes. 30% of them do not know that they have the disease. So based on this calculation, we have for about 12 million diabetic people in Turkey. And diabetic people are, affect, are affected negatively. En çok etkilenen grup. It's the largest group with the most negative effects. If you remember, during the first days of the pandemic, which are spread from China from Wuhan, the virus spread all around the world, and then we have watched our TVs and seen people going from one place to another. Düşüyor yere. 
some of them uh, fall down and uh, die. Actually, this is not real at all. People falling down uh, as they walk and uh, die. And followed by that, the virus enters Europe, uh, all the globe, uh, the United States, and it was seen in the White House. And in many European countries, we have some initial concerns. Even when uh, it was not in uh, Europe, in Canada, and, and, and then uh, Prince Charles got the virus. So in a very short time, the world got into a panic uh, environment. And in this panic environment, if you just think of it strategically, chronic diseases was affected by COVID. Diabetes is coming first in these chronic diseases, followed by cardiovascular diseases. So this was an unknown virus. We did not have a drug uh, for the virus. We did not have a vaccine for it. And after that, actually, I'm one of those people. We somehow panicked uh, people with diabetes and that resulted in a kind of chain reaction, a kind of negative uh, reaction. Soru işareti oluşturdu ve e, olumsuz e, bununla ilişki olarak and e, we had a big question mark about ben what to do for diabetic people. So in my speech today, I will be talking to you about e, the management of diabetes gereken, uh, in COVID-19, e, and istiyorum. I will be covering a number Şimdi of questions soru, that uh, beg the answer. So the first question is, is uh, I mean, diabetes uh, an independent factor that increases mortality in COVID-19? The COVID-19 related uh, death, if we look at research carried out in this area, it is seen that diabetic people have a higher rate of mortality, but uh, age uh, and cardiovascular disease form the yeah, largest factor. Uh, but diabetes, uh, I mean, glycemic uh, regulation is normal, and if you have no complication, and if you have no other ancillary comorbidities, uh, there is no study showing us that COVID-19 increases mortality in diabetic people. And what we do here is to go into a kind of classification. I mean, more than 50% of diabetic people have no complication, glycemic regulation is normal, and no other uh, additional comorbidity. So if you look at such a group, we can say that they, their mortality rate is no higher than uh, their own age group. <coughs> And second, uh, another important finding related to this issue is whether uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a di diabetogenic virus. Are we talking about a diabetogenic virus when we talk about SARS and COVID-19? In the scientific world, we have had numerous heated arguments about this question when a patient has no diabetes at all and when uh, he has a COVID-19 diagnosis. Uh, he might come up with diabetes during the COVID-19 uh, infection. So numerous cases were reported about this. And uh, in later studies, we have seen that coronaviruses are diabetogenic viruses. So that means if you are uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, and if you are not uh, diabetic before, you might have diabetes. After being diagnosed with COVID-19, and the underlying reason for that is the pancreatic eye cells being binded to H2 cells, 
and it results in an acute hyperglycemia, uh, and which most probably uh, contributes to a higher mortality rate. It decreases the risk. But when we talk about the risk, what we are really talking about is due to COVID-19. Diabetes olan enfeksiyon sırasında ortaya çıkan hastalar. Those uh, have diabetes after the infection, and other than this, the SARS and coronavirus, and in exocrine and endocrine pancreas, these are areas where we see increasing. And what are the factors that affect or increase mortality and mortality in COVID-19 and diabetic patients? We have three factors. If we are talking about uh, glucose control and no organ damage and comorbidity, we can say that based on the age group of the patients, they would not have an additional risk. But if we are talking about a bad uh, glucose control and organ damage and a comorbidity, then uh, the risk increases. So, uh, if we are talking about high uh, if the glycemic control is bad, COVID-19 is, I mean, if the fasting glucose levels are higher, the course of the COVID-19 disease is worse. And multiple organ failures might come up. This hemoglobin A1C, it is a speed of 7%. We have a mortality risk of 1.1%. But if the hemoglobin A1C level is above 9%, the rate of mortality is 11.1%, which is 10 times higher. So, uh, frankly, speaking, if it's between 70 and 180 uh, milligram, uh, then you can have this mortality rate in the patients. Let's move on to the second factor. What are the diabetic complications affecting COVID-19 mortality? And the highest uh, is the ischemic uh, heart disease. I mean, the ischemic uh, heart disease on its own, independent of diabetes, is an important risk factor. But one thing that has to be kept in mind is this. The number one reason for cardiovascular diseases is is diabetes. Hence, if we are talking about uh, people with cardiovascular diseases, we have diabetes. Diabetes is number one reason for that. So uh, they increase risk for mortality, and cerebrovascular diseases uh, also increase mortality, and kidney diseases, and along with that, uh, nephropathy, uh, uh, uh, autonomous neuropathy. Well, in these patients, we have a risk which is uh, almost ten times higher. What are the comorbidities other than this? If we are uh, talking about obesity and advanced age, if your patients have hypertension, and uh, if there are these impairments of coagulation in blood, then uh, those patients might uh, be in need of intensive care during their course of COVID-19. In COVID-19, uh, what drugs should we use and when uh, should we use those drugs? I mean, we, have, uh, we do not have any consensus about uh, this. 
Covid olursa olursa hangi dönemde Türkiye Diyabet Vakfı olarak bir As the Turkish Diabetes Foundation, we have issued a consensus report about this course, and based on this report, I mean, the Ministry of Health has come up with a classification system, and based on this classification, we have phase one, two, three, and four. And this will be a very brief summary, actually. So, uh, in phase one, we do not have pneumonia, we only have upper respiratory uh, problems, and we do not have a specific treatment for them. In phase two, we have uh, pneumonia, and the patient should definitely uh, get an insulin treatment in phase two, and along with that, uh, we might use a metamorphin-like anti-diabetic uh, agent. And in phase two B, we are talking about severe pneumonia, and the oxygen saturation levels are lower, so uh, we are in need of an intensive insulin treatment for the patient. In phase 3, we are talking about the uh, intensive care group, and in this intensive care group, again, we have to administer uh, an intensive insulin treatment along with some uh, liquid treatment. So, uh, how did COVID-19 affect uh, those diabetic people staying at home? COVID-19 infection, I mean, if your patients do not have a COVID-19 infection, they did not go out and they stayed in quarantine. And uh, so, what can we say about these quarantine uh, conditions? Well, first of all, let me tell you that in our patients, uh, carbohydrate intake increased by 21% in our patients because uh, they have started uh, eating uh, more with, since they are staying at home. And they have started uh, weight. And daily exercise has dropped by 42%. And in, in relation to that, stress and depression uh, increased by 87%. So in diabetes treatment, we have three main factors other than drugs. This is nutrition. It is uh, affected negatively. Proper nutrition is, uh, it, it becomes more challenging for people. Uh, physical exercise, while since, uh, people are in lockdown, they, they, do, they cannot exercise. And in relation to that, stress and depression results in increased level of blood sugar. In blood sugar levels, well, this is... An interesting uh, study. What has changed in the life of a diabetic patient who has stayed for 30 days at home during the pandemic? So first of all, the uh, hemoglobin uh, 1C has increased by 2.2% and uh, in, uh, in, in, in, as part of nephropathy. Um, in, uh, Weight gain uh, increased by 9.3%. So, if we are talking about an increase of two base points, it is an increase from 7% to 9%. Beyaz alandan, also sarı alanı geçip, yani makroangiopati alanı geçip kırmızı alanı geçip. Or it exceeds the macroangiopati area and moves into the red area. And this is a hugely negative impact. Böbrek bozukluğu, kidney disorder, yükseliyor, artıyor. Well, retinopati is 3%. Ama buna karşılık hareketsiz yaşam, Diabet hastalarda bacak amputasyonu diabet diabet hastalarda bacak amputasyonu yüzde on nokta iki oranında yükseltiyor. Şimdi yüzde iki nokta iki ne anlama geliyor? Two point two percent. Atılarsa bir önceki saatte demiştik ki emoglobin arttığı yedinin altında olunca 
mortality oranı yüzde bir nokta birken, so the mortality e, rate uh, was one point one percent. Emoglobin harcı dokuzun üstüne çıktığı zaman, emoglobin A one C when it's about nine yani percent, it's moves from eleven percent, so it's a tenfold increase. Pandemide evde kalan otuz gün evde kalan e, bir diyabetli hastanın So if a diabetic patient stays uh, at home, that means the mortality rate increases by 10 uh, folds. So in relation to that, during the pandemic, so we still want it. We have this diabetes support program. So in relation to this diabetic uh, management, Pandemiye değil, bu süreç içinde sürekli olarak işte diyabet yönetimine fokuslanması için So we uh, e, urge our patients to focus on diabetes uh, management. We have warned our patients. Burada gördüğünüz dört kurum sürekli olarak destek oldu. So diyabet are these four yani institutions uh, e, the foundation for diabetic uh, patients? E, işte bununla beraber... Diabet Diyetisyenleri Derneği, Diabetic Dietitians Foundation, the Turkey Diabetic Foundation. All these institutions have been supporting our patients. So let's move on to a contemporary subject. Our pneumonia and flu vaccination. Should diabetic people have these? Well, first of all, Oh, let me uh, say this. Uh, in Turkey, for many long years, uh, we have been part of an unnecessary anti-vaccination campaign. This anti-vaccination campaigns in Turkey uh, have long affected people, and we have uh, we have really tried to stand against it. So that is like ihtiyacı olmayan insanların e, sürekli olarak aşı olduğunu, aşı People have been vaccinated uh, for nothing actually, uh, even when they did not need it. So what is the uh, main argument here? I mean, we are talking about diabetic uh, patients here. Diabetes is an immune system failure. Uh, And mantar görülmez diyabetlerde görülür. Diyabetli olmayanlarda atipik nörobiller görülmez. Non diabetic patients we do not have a typical pneumonia for example. But in contrast to that, I'm talking about diabetic people who are not treated well and diabetes weakens the immune system significantly. Hence, in diabetic patients. Uh, a vaccination program is uh, suggested, but there is a group amongst these, which is hugely important, actually. Uh, in this group of patients, uh, there is no uh, argument at all. Diabetic people above the age of 60, So, certainly, they need to have a uh, uh, vaccination for coronavirus. And the uh, diabetic adjustment, if it's uh, not uh, ideal, I mean, if the hemoglobin A1C is about 8%, the uh, length of diabetes, if we are talking about a diabetic patient uh, carrying the diagnosis for more than 10 years, So uh, they are part of this group, and uh, organ failure uh, related to diabetes. In any organ failure, uh, they need to have a vaccination. And if we are talking about uh, additional comorbidities, in addition to diabetes, like obesity, heart diseases, hypertension, and smoking, so these people should have a vaccination. So in summary, diabetes. Diabetli hastalar COVID-19 aşısından, COVID-19 aşısından yüksek riskli değildir. 
Diabetojenik bir virüstür. Is there diabetogenic uh, virus? Diabetes is O süreç içinde diabet ortaya çıkabilir. If the patient is non-diabetic, uh, they might uh, be diagnosed with diabetes during the infection. And once the infection is eradicated, then uh, diabetes uh, might go away. So there are three important things. You need to have a efficient control of blood sugar. If you do not have a control of blood sugar, the risk is ten times higher, as I have said. And lastly, Let me highlight Tarantina once again, da, in quarantine, kalan, uh, during e, lockdown, e, nedeniyle, and those uh, who ihmal eden insanların ignore their diabetes e, management due to the, uh, lockdown, they need to protect themselves against COVID-19. E, Uh, daha sağlıklı being, beslenmeleri, uh, more careful, daha düzenli egzersizleri sürdürmeleri, diet, nutritional ve mutlaka ilaçlarını düzenli kullanmaları ve de orada kan şekerlerini e, e, and, e, e, düzenli said, olarak they need to have a regular blood sugar and they need to measure it on a regular basis. And if we are talking about the high risk group, they need to be a part of a vaccination program. So uh, this is all I will have to tell you about this issue. I guess soruları onlar bittikten sonra üzerinden gideceğiz. I think we will have questions later on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very uh, informative speech. We will be moving on so. to our next uh, speaker from Istinye University. Professor uh, Tanju Besler will be with us. Professor uh, Besler uh, has worked uh, for numerous public and uh, private institutions in ministries uh, on areas of administration And in 2010, he took part in the National Obesity Program, uh, and he have also worked as a coordinator. He will be with us in a minute. Uh, Professor evet, Fesler, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation and for this opportunity.
Well, welcome to our meeting. The floor is yours. Yes. Selena, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by uh, introducing myself because you have not introduced my, my me. Well, uh, I had announced you before you logged on and you, you did not hear it. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. Let me start. Well, actually, well, in this, uh, this is the fourth uh, meeting we are having uh, in this uh, Health, uh, Nutrition and Communication uh, Congress. We have listened to our speaker from uh, Hajetepe University and Dr. Stone, and uh, we have also talked about the relation between uh, COVID-19 and diabetes. Professor Sahat Unal uh, shared his perspective at, on vaccination, of course, and we have been informed about the global realities related to COVID-19 and vaccination. So as part of all of this, uh, it was like vaccination uh, would be the most important issue uh, for us. That was a note I have taken. And uh, we have later listened to our speaker from the United Kingdom, who focused on the evaluation and use of scientific data. He alerted us to the fact that we should be very cautious uh, in these areas. My presentation is also about uh, these uh, issues because uh, especially after March, the uh, COVID-19 publications uh, have been published in uh, journals with huge impact. And that was a very speedy process and it still goes on actually. So all these are in the following days will be very crucial for us uh, in terms of evidence-based studies. Some of them will be questioned, but some others will have to be uh, omitted from those journals because uh, there are some serious problems in some of these publications. So the three uh, speakers uh, before me have talked about nutrition, the immune system and COVID-19 and uh, generally uh, diseases related to malnutrition. Of course, uh, since November 2019, I mean, people say that it has started much earlier, but the World Health Organization has, uh, in a way, uh, focused on uh, the importance of nutrition. In the beginning, that discourse was somehow weaker, but uh, later on, in the later uh, course of the pandemic, we have come to the understanding that nutrition plays an important role in the course of the disease. So uh, we know that nutrition is already an important concept in our lives. So I will be referring to a number of uh, researchers, uh, mostly from 2020 and also uh, from last year, from uh, important uh, countries and from important uh, researchers published in uh, journals. In 2020, as you can see, the uh, American Nutrition Foundation has published an important abstract, the coronavirus disease, uh, 2019, and nutritional status. What did the missing link? So that missing link needs to be studied because we do not know much about it. And that study uh, makes it very clear that we have to know a lot more in this area. Together with COVID-19, uh, as the world uh, uh, started uh, what COVID-19 was all about, Sahad Unal, our first speaker, uh, it, I mean, uh, he talked about malaria and other uh, diseases and pandemics like the plague uh, th throughout history. So, uh, for in, in both experimental models and in living organisms,
from the perspective of nutrition and the regulation of uh, nutrition, uh, the response to cytokines in the organism uh, could, can be regulated. It seems uh, very evident. So let me highlight uh, this. Uh, so the organism, uh, the the the uh, store, uh, the stores of the metabolism are affected. I mean, uh, in patients which are who are hospitalized and intubated, and after the treatment, uh, once uh, they are dispatched from the hospital. Well, they lose uh, muscle mass, uh, and we observe this. So from this perspective, actually, the most important and the, the, the factor is about uh, this uh, obesity and it, it related comorbidities. This uh, chart, actually, if you look at it carefully, in COVID-19, uh, it, it is very much in line with the visible symptoms of COVID-19 together with the increase of uh, chronic in pro-inflammatory state. So we have uh, serious changes there. Uh, chronic inflammatory cytokines, uh, interleukin, uh, alpha, beta, uh, these are uh, important cytokines. In endothelial, uh, endothelial uh, damage is observed and the functionalities are impaired. So today, this shows the efficiency of the virus. So this is a kind of mechanism based on that kind of process. And the ACE2 uh, relation between the virus and all the processes result in a cytokine storm. But if we look uh, in the background, if the body mass index is impaired, the ACE2 cytokines go into a kind of volatility and change. So oxidative stress, I mean, again, in COVID-19, especially in infectious diseases, is something we see very frequently. And, and we are talking about an elevated oxidant uh, stress. The oxidant uh, stress should be balanced with antioxidants and proper uh, nutrition. So nutrition modulation stands out as an important factor. And another uh, thing is that for the time being, all these are hypothetical approaches. Dr. Uh, Julian, our second speaker, has also mentioned that these hypothetical uh, talks, uh, data, uh, which are transported from other sets of data. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have evidence-based information uh, on our hands, so we will have to wait uh, a bit more, and hopefully uh, we will be doing uh, knowing more so that the disease and nutrition relationality will be much more clarified. So again, my speech is, seems to be in parallel with the first uh, speak, uh, speaker, actually. Philip Calder uh, is an English uh, scientist, uh, and he has numerous publications in this area. Uh, as Sarhat Bey has said, uh, he has, I mean, he uses the same terminology, uh, and he has work on nutrition, immunity, and COVID-19. In the British Medical uh, Journal, this is a series of uh, publications by him, and I would like to uh, recommend to all our participants to read these articles. This is, again, a hypothetical introduction. These are published in the British Medical Journal, and especially the nutritional uh, factors, how they affect COVID-19. And especially in my area, in my uh, speech that was highlighted in red, 
So uh, a number of vitamins, A, B, B6, folate, uh, C and D. But I, I won't be going into too much detail about all these supplements, but I will be focusing more on vitamin C. So uh, between uh, vitamin D and COVID-19. So in the afternoon, uh, Professor Mizanski will deliver a talk on this uh, issue. Vitamin E, again, uh, is uh, the same. And against oxidative uh, damage, we know that these are micronutrients. And from the perspective of minerals, uh, zinc, uh, copper and iron need to be used uh, uh, for a proper uh, modulation. And as a first source, as I, ha as I have said, uh, the uh, fatty acids, uh, the omega-3 uh, acids. In the United Kingdom, uh, there is a 2020 data uh, pu published in the journal. It's around 12 pages. It's about nutritional status, diet, and viral respiratory infections. And it deals about its relation with coronavirus too and and of course it, it's there are hypothetical statements as well but then uh, the studies highlight the uh, nutritional deficiency aspect of uh, SARS-CoV-19 that it causes decrease in appetite so uh, the individual's historical diet and nutrition forms a basis on such uh, infec infectious diseases. And any deficiencies or, I mean, improvements in, in nutrition may decrease or increase infections. This study also has a key finding, as I showed in my previous slide, against the COVID virus, certain uh, malnutritions may increase susceptibility for COVID. And after the infection, it, it, also, it is also correlated with the hospitalization, incubation, or the intensive care treatment. Especially for obese uh, individuals, again, hypothetically, the adipose tissue is increased and there is a, there is a reduced risk in inflammation. And, and this inflammation is related with the, co the infection of COVID. And what one of the key issues about the organism, and this can be modulated, that is nutrition and diet approach. And an unbalanced diet, a suboptimum diet, simple sugar and and in in and in so in, in societies where sugar is excessively consumed, there is a there is a higher risk of infection. And in America there are daily cases where uh, exceeding hundred thousands, and this we believe is correlated with malnutrition. The fats and hyd hydrogenated fats, I mean, we reduce them, but depending on the socioeconomic situation, the type of fat also changes. So the so when the diet is not of higher quality the risk of infection increases. Malnutrition is a dramatic situation with malnutrition, other uh, diet-related problems will lay the way for f future infections. How about the relation with, I mean, I mean, I mean we know that a, a quality diet has positive relations with immune response. 
any problem with nutrition and diet and uh, if the nutrition quality is not high enough and if the individual is not consuming enough water and not exercising regularly all these negatively affect the immune system indeed talking about nut nutrition as a scientist now what happens exactly uh, during uh, COVID-19 infection and I'm trying to find the relation between nutrition there are, there are six factors one of them is the cytokine storm everybody says that it's so abnormal it is beyond uh, imagination it's, it's like a storm and then coagulation it is also related with endothelium uh, leukopenia and, and, and, and, and lymphopenia they clearly indicate uh, the uh, impaired immune system and, and, and hypoxia the loss of muscles together with uh, muscle loss we have respiratory problems and the most important of all is the oxidative ox, oxidative stress this is not a not an hierarch, hierarchical order it is just the six key factors cytokine storm coagulation leukopenia lymphopenia hypoxia and oxidative stress are six key elements of covid 19 infection how about vitamin c there are some studies on it uh, this is going to be published in 2021 and the aging and disease journal according to, to this study i mean we know that there, there are there's a number of serious clinical studies ongoing clinical studies about covid 19 and number six is from istanbul turkey from my university Istiye university and i just learned it So one of the investigators is from Turkey State University and they are researching vitamin C uh, and as, a, as a part of the th therapy protocol. So what is the distinction we should make? Nutrition before getting infected. That is our daily diet regardless of the infection and what happens after the infection uh, what are the what are the expected changes in our uh, diet all these studies are about the efficacy of uh, vitamin c in treatment and we know that in intensive care units uh, the high doses of like like of vitamin c is injected intravenously like an average size of orange or two apples and one kiwi will normally suffice for the, the, the, the daily vitamin C need of, of an individual but in treatment an overdose of one gram is injected to the individuals and nutrition is crucial and I want to highlight uh, that nutrition in all circumstances it is it plays a key role in uh, in the formation of any disease well <clears throat> lung disease for example before me professor Temer you must uh, mentioned diabetes and related cases but we know that the lifestyle <clears throat> and diet are so imp so effect so effective on the prognosis of diseases You know, in, in, in 1970s, the, the, the, the daily calorie intake was around 1,500, but now it is above 2,000, and it even reaches the 2,800s. That was back in 2010, <clears throat> and in, in certain cases, it's, it's even higher. And with the increased intake, daily calorie intake, adolescent obesity also increases. So nutrition is a key, par key parameter on health. 
impaired nutrition does not uh, automatically mean that the diseases occur, but nutrition, diet, and lifestyle changes, change of living uh, environment, and the effect of certain medications will cause uh, epigenetic causes. Like it's it's it's, it's not it's not like uh, we, we, we before waiting any uh, mutations. And certain DNA effects can be observed, and certain diseases may uh, may may happen. And diabetes and type two diabetes are among them. Well, chromatin, chromatins, and there uh, there there are renewed models on on on chromatins. For type two diabetes, we can talk about an epigenetical transformation. Hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia, uh, and then it evolves to type two diabetes. Food intake and its neurobiology. I mean, recently there are uh, changes on that, yeah, but we are talking about quality food. There are factors suppressing or or or encouraging food intake if if you have just i mean in in in situations where there is no where, where, where the diet is I mean, nutrition is suboptimal uh, there are increased diseases like in mice like with insulin discharge uh, their their health situation dramatically changes when they are when, when mice are, are fed with sh refined sugar. This is an article published in the journal. It's about uh, you know that there are a number of factors affecting the nutrition quality, and it's not only uh, health uh, disparities, but there are. That there are problems in supplying the food, and there are economic disparities, and they cause they may cause mental problems, chronic diseases, in increases mortality and morbidity, and also risk of chronic diseases. Nutri diet, immunity, and infection we know because malnutrition or it impairs immune system, increases susceptibility to infections, and it, it impairs the immune response and with impaired immune response, risk of in infection elevates. If it is a viral infection like COVID, susceptibility dramatically increases. So that is why we're talking about distance, mask, isolation, hygiene, and then we should always underline uh, lifestyle changes. The healthy diet approaches, individualized nutrition is important, food quality is, should be increased, and that may help correcting an impaired uh, immune response. When the Im immune system is impaired, and, and until when it remains impaired, a thousand days starting from the pregnancy, the first 1,000 days are crucial. The nutrition of the mother, it's not just the baby, but the nutrition of the of, of mother. And even before getting pregnant, and including the, the, the future fathers, their nutrition are crucial in the development of immune system. So what I must say is 1,000 days until the end of the first two years. The, the nutrition in the first two years, when the, when, the, when the infant is dependent on the mother and father, those first 1,000 days shape the overall immune response of the infant, and, and you know, uh, the brain develops and the immune system develops uh, 
pancreas, the insulin secretion, and all other secretions evolve in, in the first 1,000 days. What happens during immune deficiency? There are tremendous changes. I don't, I, I don't have time to deal with all of them today. <clears throat> you know, T cells and B cells, they have deficiencies and their functions may be impaired. Immune globulin uh, generation. There, there, there, will, there will be lots of impairments on the immune system. We know how it happens. This study is about nutrition, immune system, and immune response modulation. This is a healthy individual and mal malnutrition individual. T lymphocytes and, and B lymph D lymphocytes in the healthy individuals. This is the rate of uh, T lymphocytes and, and this is with malnutrition kids and adults. And in addition to B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, we have we have these no cells which which are and we have T cells, B cells and cells with our, with all these malnourished uh, patients their number of T cells dramatically decrease and the clusters on, on, on the cells and, they are, and, and, and, and the efficacy on the on the antigen spe specific pathways and these are the treated you know healthy ones the CD3, CD4 see how the lymphocyte counts uh, decrease in malnutrition in, with, a, with, a, with a healthy nutrition this uh, CD3, CD4 and CD8 rates dramatically improve so nutrition before before the disease and then nutrition during the disease and lifestyle I mean this this this this is this is true for both infectious diseases like COVID or other diseases like diabetes but nutrition is of paramount importance for all this is a diagram drawn by my uh, my professor in, during my doctoral thesis you know, T and B cells, you know, immune system cells uh, are impaired. So we need a nutrition that will modulate and correct this uh, immune system. We need immunomodulation. So if there is malnutrition, immune system will be impaired. And these N3 and N6 fatty acids and omega omega 3 fat, fats fatty cell uh, acids are important. This is Alcivia published uh, a, a study on free radicals and it says N3 and, and fatty acids are critical and they are like in competition uh, with the N6 fat, fatty acids. And and and three fatty acids instead of N six or omega omega three. They affect the tr thrombocyte biology, or they also increase endothelial um, damages. So the, the changes in, in the combination of these fatty acids are, are important in the immune system. So these fatty acids should be carefully evaluated during a COVID-19 infection. Well, there are of course potential benefits and also potential adverse effects because in COVID-19 infection there is a heightened oxidative stress. And fatty acids, their count and they and they are dual uh, car carbon uh, when we increase them we can also increase the oxidative stress so we need to find the balance we need to be careful about omega omega-3 and 
because omega-3 uh, is eff efficacious on the modulation of, of the cy cytokines. So omega-3 is important in this. And zinc as nutritional intervention and prevention measure for COVID-19. There are some studies going on with a higher age for type 2 diabetes and obesity. This is a long chart. You know, this one was published on British Medical Journal. And all uh, and, and the audience can benefit here. And what we can see here, here is in infection and if there is comorbidity, zinc levels dramatically decrease. So increasing uh, food quality and giving patient zinc rich uh, diet will help uh, you know, uh, fight the immune system. Also, this is another study from 2020. Another, it, it goes over the potential theories. Of course, these studies need further proof, but they are they are published on on on leading journals. We know a number of uh, therapies have been tested, but we don't know yet. Uh, we don't have yet, you know, a clear one. You know, this this one shows over 10 uh, medications and when and when medications are used, their interaction with food should be analyzed. You know, zinc, selenium, vitamin E, and then we have fl fl fl flavonoids. And then for a med Mediterranean diet, you know, f high, rich in fruit and vegetables and energy regulated individualized nutrition flavonoids are consumed they exist from potatoes to to to the tangerines and from turnip to to, to many many others so we have these uh, diet in in in our region which are rich in terms of antioxidants nutrition and uh, microbiota relation you know with COVID-19 microbiota is impaired and this and especially in early phase and late phase the, the, to, in order to reduce the severity of inflammation nutrition will play a key role because the an impaired uh, microbiota uh, also causes uh, impairments in the immune response. And this is another hypothetical study from Turkey. You know, of nutrition, you know, I mean, these are hypothetical studies and theories which say nutrition may help decreasing the effects of uh, COVID-19 infections, but of course these require further scrutiny. This is a review of vitamin A, C, D, E, selenium, zinc, copper and magnesium, and they are all efficacious on immune system. Italians in 2020 run this study. It's a nutritional, a, a diet pi pi pyramid against um, COVID-19. I added water. I mean, water was there, but I added because daily daily intake of water is very important. And in the, in the Turkish society, we have a problem with that. We need uh, to increase the liquid intake, water intake on our daily diet. There are things that we can benefit. You know, COVID-19 decreases social interactions and that ha that also has negative effects on nutrition so we need to decrease social interaction decrease physical activities and physical inactivities i mean we, we of course we don't want it But we need, but we need to reduce physical activity that is related to social interaction and need to rest. But then, when we are discussing all these, 
in terms of the communication of uh, nutrition and health, this is a double burden. There is a double burden of malnutrition. On the one hand, we have overnutrition. On the other hand, we have malnutrition. On the one hand, we have hidden hunger and that it causes certain deficiencies of vitamins. And, and we know that the hidden hunger, 450 million individuals suffer hidden hunger and they have vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So we need optimum diet. And starting from the very early ages, nutrition should, um, f further emphasis should be given to nutrition. And especially during the primary education, even, even uh, preschool care, nutritional education should be given to kids uh, and our, we need to educate our kids on proper nutrition. In Turkey, we have taken a number of steps by the Ministry of Education. And I know that Sabr Uke Foundation is also involved with that, and we are all very proud of it. So never give up a healthy, uh, sufficient, and balanced diet, especially for kids aged 5 to 9. We need to keep educating our kids. But we need to do this in a proper way. We need to measure it. We need to assess the results and to find the very best model in, in practice. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanji Besler, for this presentation. Thank you very much sir, for, for this speech. Our next speaker is another valuable dietitian from Istanbul University, a professor on nutrition and diet, uh, expert dietitian, Selatin Dönmez will be with us. Mr. Dönmez is member of Turkish Dietitian Society, also the American Academy of Nutrition and and he's also a member of the food uh, and communication platform, Salatin Dönmez. He's also a member of board in, in, in, in several universities. And soon we will have, it, uh, with a, have, it, have him with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the fourth uh, Nutrition and Communication Conference and I'm very happy for uh, being here. In uh, my speech today, I will be talking to you about the position and place of micronutrients in COVID-19. So let's uh, have a look at what global uh, 
data tells us the newly infected uh, people, uh, well, 85% of uh, them, almost 80% of them are uh, asymptomatic, and 84% uh, percent, uh, of them have uh, mild symptoms, and 9.6% of them have mild symptoms. So this uh, is a really a uh, source of curiosity from a scientific perspective, actually. Against COVID-19, uh, I mean, we have to understand why some people are more uh, susceptible to the disease and uh, why some of them are affected by it. And in COVID-19, uh, we, we have to understand uh, why they are more uh, sensitive. If we will be talking about micronutrients and some supplements, mineral supplements, we need to think about uh, immune systems of these people and how these micronutrients and uh, mineral supplements affect uh, the immune system. Professor uh, Tanju Besler has talked to us about the immune uh, system. So um, I will be talking to you about the metabolic uh, factors related to the virus and the host. So how we should be handling these micronutrients and, and whether we could have a different perspective. So let's uh, have a look at these metabolic uh, factors. Because uh, immune, uh, the immunity that comes from birth or uh, acquired immunity uh, might be related to age and other indications and other health factors. So these are all interrelated with uh, each other and it affects the risk for uh, being diagnosed with COVID-19. And we need to acknowledge comorbidities, the social, the social and economic uh, situation, and excessive alcohol use, obesity, and coronary uh, heart disease and hypertension. Although they might be uh, different from one another, um, the elderly, I mean, uh, old people are affected mostly by this disease. So what is the relationality between micronutrients and COVID-19? Because the natural immune system is uh, getting weaker as uh, throughout aging, the mucosal uh, membranes become weaker And this uh, weak immune system uh, is seen mostly in uh, people between uh, ages 70 to 80. We all know about a term, uh, immunoassessance. Uh, this refers to the uh, weakening of the immune system as uh, aging, during aging. Vitamin A, B, uh, I mean, uh, vitamin B12 or late and iron and zinc uh, levels or i mean if you if you have these uh, minerals and vitamins low in the plasma uh, levels that might be an interaction between uh, covid-19 from the perspective of uh, nutrition immunology how can we uh, well, we need to understand how they are cooperated and how they work in coordination with one another uh, as we all know, the bone marrow is the main area where uh, the immune cells are produced and the spleen uh, is perhaps the another important area where we have this uh, formation of immune cells. The dendrites, and it, it, this is uh, the T1 and 2 cells important for the adaptive immunity are produced here. And it is also important for the synthesis of these uh, cells. The lymph nodes uh, spread throughout the body and that they act as an uh, immunogenic filtration. But the gut system, they, they are effective in uh, the production of some gut uh, cells and flora. And the... Um, micronutrients have numerous effects in this area. Let's have a look at this uh, situation. 
vitamin A, D, C, uh, B6, B12, folate, and iron and zinc are important. And the innate, innate immune response needs to be developed through uh, a number of uh, supplements like these, selenium and magnesium, in addition to the ones I have just listed. And also the production of uh, anti antibodies and antigens. Uh, well, these are affected by uh, these vitamins and minerals as well. These cellular immunity and humoral immunity are also uh, complement one another. But one thing that is mixed and confused here is uh, how does this virus recognize the uh, immune response? Because it acts differently from other diseases, actually. If you look at literature, uh, I mean, whether this is innate or adaptive, how does our immune system recognize the virus? So in summary, for epithelial barrier cells and uh, cellular immunity and the production of antibody, uh, selenium, zinc and copper, uh, they have a very uh, crucial place. So all around the world, as we see, uh, the, product, the consumption of micronutrients uh, increase uh, significantly. And other than this, uh, I mean, in relation to uh, nutrients, we have also uh, ongoing discussions, uh, like uh, we need to consume some spices like uh, sumac or poison ivy uh, and other supplements. So, uh, referring to a specific food in terms of epithelial cells and antibi antibody production, So the natural and adaptive immune response activation and might be resulting in a pathogen uh, cleaning. Uh, so that's why we have focused on micronutrients once uh, the pandemic uh, broke out around the world. So this is from United Kingdom. It's a kind of perspective uh, for us. And it's about the individual sensitivity to the course of COVID-19 in the context of uh, deficiency of certain nutrients. So there are two important factors here. One is about COVID-19 and the epithelial cells, because uh, the innate immune system is activated uh, in a much more stronger way for proliferation. But secondarily, uh, the immune system and the uh, epithelial cells, I mean the viral and uh, host response, play an important role, of course. But in the absence of a specific nutrient, uh, you might have a more severe course of COVID-19 because the patient might produce an individual response. So for a normal functioning of the immune system, we need vitamin A, vitamin D, uh, B6, folate, and B12 vitamins. These are really essential, uh, especially for our uh, anti-immunity. Uh, zinc plays an important role, uh, and, and in antiviral immunity, uh, and its uh, deficiency might increase sensitivity to diseases. Se selenium and uh, copper. Well, selenium, as we all know, it's uh, crucial for glutathione uh, peroxidases and it affects the body's oxidative uh, stress uh, response. And once uh, we have selenium deficiency, the risk for viral infections uh, increase. So selenium and copper minerals uh, are important. Hufik in 2020, has stated that, well, with these nutrients and immunomodulation and immunonutrition, 
have a close relation between one another. But for the time being, no uh, relation between these micronutrients and COVID-19 has been defined. This is a chronological perspective from the perspective of micronutrients. So this is a meta-analysis of 43 studies uh, and it focuses on individuals with malnutrition and uh, the crucial question is whether these micronutrients might be fruitful and uh, helpful for these patients and the results are for the positive uh, for uh, malnutrition uh, the supplementation of vitamins and uh, minerals have turned out to be playing a positive role let me skip this uh, quickly. For example, from vitamin A, uh, 5,000 international units per day. And when uh, the diagnosis comes, it could be up to 20,000 international units. Especially in individual uh, quarantine uh, period. But... Uh, from this perspective, in general uh, viral diseases, vitamin C plays an important role and it should not be I mean, our previous speakers have talked about it. Uh, zinc plays an important role as well from uh, viral diseases. Selenium, uh, copper and magnesium they do not have a direct influence, but uh, selenium and uh, copper might have a positive effects. But other than these, nutricides and probiota probiotics are being discussed uh, widely as well. In uh, nutraceutics, um, like uh, garlic uh, might have a limited uh, effect in probiotics, again, in protection against viral diseases, might be uh, helpful in our fight against the viruses. During the pandemic, well, this was published in April, and later, uh, chronologically speaking, we have had a number of other recommendations uh, so anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects are taken as a reference. So in this publication, the uh, role of uh, COVID-19 uh, in relation to uh, nutrition, the polyphenols, vitamins, minerals, uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, and, and they decrease oxidative stress. But even at the time, the uh, deficiency of vitamin D and other minerals uh, ha have turned out to be playing an important role in the course of the disease. And another nutrition support uh, has turned out to be the uh, nicotinamide uh, ribocyte, uh, which is a coenzyme and it might have a therapeutical effect but the at the end of the compilation all these micronutrients might have a potential antiviral uh, effect but in order for us to uh, be certain about their effect we need more detailed studies but this is not only about protection because uh, i mean uh, in patients uh, in ventilation, when we have a, had an increase in those patients, well, especially uh, in uh, acute respiratory problems and in lung diseases, the enteral nutrition applications, EPA and gamma linolenic uh, acid, uh, it will have a number of uh, small inputs. But the best uh, guideline has been like In uh, nutrition management, uh, ESPAN has come up with the best recommendation.
So there are two important uh, institutions. One is the Brazilian Clinical Nutrition Foundation in 2020. So they have worked on probiotic supplement, uh, but they have stated that uh, these only uh, affect the immune system and they do not have a direct relation. So you could have uh, like, uh, you have to take vitamin C. You could take vitamin C uh, by two grams per day, and that might be an indication. Zinc support uh, should not uh, exceed 40 milligrams. And a higher dose of selenium, like 200 milligrams per day, might be helpful for uh, against COVID-19. But perhaps... Uh, and for me, this is the most meaningful piece of information coming from UFIC again. Uh, we are in need of nutritional support only when we do not have a natural uh, and uh, good uh, nutrition uh, system in our daily lives. There are numerous studies, of course. I have tried to include the uh, most important one of them. This is from the United States. It's a great uh, recommendation for pharmaceuticals in the States just to raise awareness. What the study tells us is that, as you know, uh, silver has not been used in our country extensively, but in the States, we have silver in uh, toothpaste and in other supplements, and vitamin C uh, has also been an important factor. So what this study tells us is that COVID-19 different from a uh, cold, it's a different virus, and vitamin C might not be sufficiently protective against uh, COVID-19 because it's a different virus. And when we're talking about prevention and treatment, uh, we need to keep away from uh, excessive dosages. So there are some minor and very important nuances. And in addition to this, uh, the drugs used uh, for COVID-19 patients, we, we have used these uh, drugs, uh, but now we have different drug uh, classes, uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and uh, zinc-supported uh, treatment uh, might offer us an almost perfect clinical treatment, but uh, we do not have sufficient data on hand to prove that these are really the definitive treatment for COVID-19. And the Sambucus nigra uh, have anti-inflammatory cytokines and they modulate them. Uh, we know that they have this capability, uh, but we do not have a specific study proving this. Collodial silver, uh, of course, and toothpaste. Uh, social media have numerous messages like this. The gastrointestinal uh, liver, long uh, toxicity uh, related to long use, and it might cause into leukemia. So we do not have a specifically defined uh, nutritional cure uh, against COVID-19. Of course, the dietitians and uh, diabetes institutions around the world uh, bring their recommendations. The Turkey Dietitians Foundation has also done the same, both on a clinical level and in our daily lives. So they have offered uh, some specific recommendations and uh, they have also published a, a review. Of, uh, our colleagues uh, have said that. But in some uh, studies, if we are talking about excessive dosing of vitamin C, D, A, uh, the inflammation might be reduced. Uh, probiotics and prebiotics. So uh, we do not have any uh, specifically defined uh, micronutrient which is useful for COVID-19. So uh, what uh, the main message here is that we need to improve our daily uh, nutrition. So let me also uh, refer to a number of studies. As you know, vitamin D, well, the first issue is uh, this. 
the spread of COVID-19 and the incidences and mortality rates of COVID-19 in the South Hemisphere and North Hemispheres are, are different. So people have uh, studied uh, on the rate of mortality. So uh, in uh, with PCR, uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID-19 uh, cases are lower. So. Uh, Again, uh, with the increase of uh, cytokines, this is a kind of cytokine uh, storm, and vitamin D uh, increases the expression of the virus, and it might produce a much more severe COVID-19 uh, course. Patients with uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, are more prone to COVID-19 and vitamin D might support innate immunity and it might be also effective in COVID-19 infection. We have randomized control studies on vitamin D and COVID-19 uh, relationship in some studies, uh, we have a correlation, but after some adjustments, uh, that correlation uh, has, it might not be visible because we do not have sufficient uh, data on hand. So from my perspective, uh, this British uh, medical journal has published this brief report and it's it has a very good, important message in order for us to evaluate the impact of vitamin D on COVID-19. Uh, as uh, Britain, we support the uh, suitable dosage principle. So we need to keep away from vitamin D deficiency on a social level, and uh, we will be sticking to the government recommendation. This is what the guideline and report uh, said. Professor Tanju Beslash had talked about uh, zinc. It has an un antiviral impact, but studies on COVID uh, have shown that uh, the pH uh, increase, the intracellular pH uh, increase, might uh, inhibit the disease significantly. So, in addition, uh, uh, zinc support will uh, affect uh, healing in patients with COVID-19. This is another study uh, that focuses on the association between regional selenium status. Uh, this is an epidemiologic study carried out in Chinese uh, provinces together with uh, samples taken from hair. There is a positive correlation, especially in uh, the elderly population but this is an issue, so the elderly might be uh, defenseless against COVID. So I will be moving fast. But in COVID-19, leukopenia, lymphopenia, since we have oxidative uh, problems, uh, we need to adjust uh, these, and we are in need of and in the inflammatory uh, balance in the critical healing uh, the virus transmission and replication might be affected. Uh, this should not be ignored and it could be used with other nutrients in uh, reasonable dosages. We have other supports, Propolis is one of those. This study is really uh, exciting. It's like Propolis will uh, 
be the number one drug against COVID-19, but there are a number of details. Well, propolis uh, has a signal preventive effect on antioxidants and on ACE2. And preclinical research tells us that uh, propolis might be encouraging in the uh, immune regulation. And it might uh, decrease the risk of a cytokine storm syndrome in COVID-19. Uh, the caffeic acid phenethyl ester is the active ingredient in propolis. Uh, so in clinical applications, it is used uh, like 1200 uh, milligrams per day. Quercetin is a flavonoid. It's a polyphenolic uh, compound and it has antipathogenic effects in animal and uh, in vitro studies. Uh, it is shown that it regulates gene expression and in other, uh, it is reported that it might be effective, but quercetin, uh, I mean, we do not have enough clinical uh, data on hand. So it is said that there is uh, no clinical relationality between the two. So there are some more interesting uh, recommendations. This is a fermented uh, uh, cabbage. T1 R ekseninde bloke edebileceği ve lahananın NRF2'nin en doğal uh, on the AT1R axis. And since it, they are rich in sulfurants, it might uh, decrease the severity of COVID-19. Of course, these are uh, really very interesting when we hear about, I mean, should we think about cabbage during pandemic? But, um, I mean, uh, it doesn't have any harm. And if you want to have a healthy nutrition, it uh, might not have uh, an impact. So what should we uh, conclude? We can say that for a healthy immunity, nutrition is very important, but a group of micronutrients might play a more predominant role in immunomodulation. And it's the modulation of immunosuppression is important uh, and together with an antiviral medical treatment. And despite their synergic impact, the virus uh, host uh, response I mean, we might have some uh, individual differences. And especially in the uh, general population, we know that we do not have great hopes uh, relate in relation to micronutrients. And high-risk individuals in society uh, might benefit from uh, nutritional supplements, especially uh, in the elderly and in patients with comorbidities. And... Uh, it's critically important to evaluate these patients with COVID-19. And uh, we do not have a clear definition for a definitive nutritional program. We need to have nutritional uh, recommendations for viral diseases. And uh, we should not forget that they might be beneficial for the clinical course of COVID-19. And the micronutrients, which we might not derive from our foods on a daily basis, uh, might, we might plan a support program in certain dosages. So what should we suggest for our country? Let me end my presentation with this. As you know, uh, in 1974, there was a great... Uh, report and guideline published for nutrition in endemic regions and then we have had other uh, smaller scale uh, studies if you look at the nutritional habits of individuals about the age of 19 I mean uh, we have focus on uh, zinc copper both men and women uh, have 
been suggested to use uh, legumes and uh, cereals. So you see the consumption levels uh, throughout different years. There is an analysis, as you know, Uh, zinc, uh, vitamin B, and folic acid are consumed uh, less than they should in the greater majority of the population. So there is a deficiency on a social scale. So we uh, focus on two comorbidities, uh, obesity and diabetes. Uh, and again, if you look at research on nutritional consumption, well, we would like to have dairy products on a daily process. But if you look at this brick color of uh, columns, you will see that our milk uh, consumption is uh, not uh, regular. A greater majority might not have access to these, pro pro uh, to these uh, foods. And uh, we need to consume uh, red meat, uh, eggs and dried legumes uh, on a regular basis. So the purple bar shows you uh, three or uh, two or three days consumption. You see that the consumption levels of these uh, useful uh, nutrients is rather low. So we do not have a two or three times weekly consumption so in the sample uh, group, uh, the consumption of vegetables and fruits is also low. And again, uh, bread is consumed in great amounts, unfortunately. So what kind of a suggestion we should come up with? And we need to, if we cannot go through an improvement in nutrition, uh, you need to consult your doctors and dietitians and plan your nutrition accordingly. Thank you. Well, uh, dear, dear Professor, thank you very much for this detailed and enlightening speech. Th thanks to you. Our next speech speaker is another great uh, dietitian, uh, Professor Barry Yeet will join us and talk about how to continue our dietary habits. What should we choose for optimum health? She is the former member of Turkish Society of Dietitians and she she keeps servicing as a dietitian. She is also at the Istanbul University lecturing on nutrition and they and and, and diet diets. She will soon join us. Thank you.
again, dear professor. Welcome back. We are happy to have you with us to listen your uh, valuable thoughts and presentation. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you on this beautiful session. I also want to thank uh, the audience for joining us today. Well, given the pandemic conditions, we cannot see e each other in person. This is, this is all around the world. But then, what about the uh, what about its effects on our diet? How about the popular diets? What are the latest trends on uh, diet and nutrition and, and immunity? Well, I know you are all locked down in your houses, and and I know that you have become some of you have become like master chefs, and you are cooking your own bread and pizza in, in the kitchen. And then we have emotional stress, we have emotional attacks of uh, binge eating, and then we are gaining weight. So, what are the core effects globally? I want to share a result of a survey conducted by Nielsen in Turkey in 12 uh, cities in A, B, and C socioeconomic groups. Over 2,000 people joined the survey. Healthy diet uh, approach increased from 19% to 25%. This sounds like encouraging although it is a small, small increase. Well, of course, it's not about, you know, losing weight and then quickly uh, recovering to our ideal weight, but maybe it's more important to rediscover that it's important to have a balanced diet and the dietitians have been receiving more questions. So was it the same for everyone? Well, half of the half of the respondents confirmed that they gained ten percent of weight, and but then I'm sorry, four kilos of weight. But then only ten percent uh, said I lost four kilos of weight. the The frequency of uh, eating uh, or I mean snacks increased by forty five percent. And then there is an increase by 10% before going to bed, which is not surprising at all, because people stay at home in front of the telly or reading newspapers. So just to fill in the gaps of all those negativity, they have that habit of you know eating snacks, but that does an increase in snack eating. Uh, the the rate of uh, cookers increased from 33% to 80%. People not ordering from outside anymore. I mean, they, they do, but in the past, 5 out of 10 people were ordering, you know, uh, d food delivery, but now only 3 out of 10 people are ordering uh, delivered food because people are nervous about hygiene. They are, they are scared of any infection. You know, people buy things and then keep them waiting on the uh, counter for hours before opening the packages. And the sensitivity for healthy cooking increased by 91, up, up to 91 percent. And and by and, and another survey by Sabri Ulker Foundation says. 30, 44% of people, I mean, for, that was a, there's a 44% increase in people who are choosing organic food in their uh, grocery uh, shopping. And and people are skipping lunch because, because of late uh, breakfast, and the rate of this increase is 32%. It is not only our dietary habits. But to boost our uh, immune system, people are using food supplements. From it, there's an increase by from 51 to 60 percent. Vitamin D use increased by seven percent. Immune boosters increased by 12 percent. Multivitamin six percent. Probiotics five percent, and pepper increased by two percent. 
and then the rest, the, the sleep, the quality of our sleep has changed. Our sleeping quality and uh, regularity was impaired by 75%. 44 people say I sleep more and 47% say I wake up late, which is not surprising at all. But sleep is uh, of tremendous importance for our uh, immunity. Exercise. People who have a habit to exercise, they, they keep this. And it increased from 54% to 90%. I mean, home exercise increased from 54 to 90%. You know, our immune system is like a shield protecting our body from inner and outer effects, but then it, it differs from for, for each individual. Like for COVID-19, some people uh, experience an asymptomatic COVID-19 infection, but then some people die or they become very sick. It depends on the age, health, the body weight and diet. It's not just the body, but then the total fat mass in, in the body, you know, losing and gaining weight frequently and uh, having a quality sleep and also mental health. People, you know, who don't know how to rest, who don't know, who, don't, who cannot manage their stress, they, they are negatively affected. Well, this is like a personal map, but uh, in that map, Nutrition is a, has a little more importance than the others. And there are things that we can change to lead a healthier life. And today I want to talk about things that we can change, uh, like sleeping better, uh, having a better diet, and increasing our physical activity. You know, we are all valuable. So to feel that the best lifestyle, first we need to... Uh, have the the ideal body weight because obesity uh, you know uh, makes you unprepared for any disease coming disease and if you are and and and if you are and and if you are not moving enough uh, that also increases obesity and that really impairs immune response i mean before me there were there were beautiful uh, presentations summarizing this but this studies confirm that obese people have deficiencies in terms of lymphocyte activation and efficacy so obesity you know having body fat you know it's not just having a bad view on on on the mirror it also functions as an organ and it brings a number of diseases simultaneously. And as your body fights against these diseases, your immune system will become we weaker. According to 75 different analyses on around 400 respondents, obese people have 13% have increase in hospitalization and loss of life, like mortality risk of obese people because of COVID-19 uh, increases by 19%. And this is COVID-19 2020 study. But the increased body mass index, the, the risk of mechanical ventilation also increases. So fighting against ob obesity Balancing the fat distribution on the body, having physical activities need to be learned and communicated to a wider society. 2020 uh, Food and Health Survey of International uh, Food uh, Information Council says 43% of the people have a specific diet and and 10% of, of it is the intermittent uh, fasting. 9% says clean uh, diet and 8% say I'm more inclined for keto, keto diet. One third says I do snacks more and one quarter says I, I think about eating more often. According to t Nielsen research, 29% of the Turks uh, are one choose the protein diet 
23% choose ad hoc, like, you know, they, they do as they wish. And 17%, which is a good news, uh, they say they, they assume Mediterranean diet. And only 1%, unfortunately, asks guidance from a dietitian. And then between seven to the one, we have keto and high fat, and there are different, you know, uh, popular diets that people uh, pr prefer. But then we are happy that uh, for a stronger immune system, not not just uh, in order to lose weight, but something that will feed your body, your mind. Uh, this is like your fingertip. It is. It is. Uh, it should be tailored, and and the, th the the right path to do is to ask advice from experts. So, uh, improving immune system has been discussed during the COVID nineteen, and as an expert, I wa I, I want to just highlight a couple of them. It's not just how what we eat, but it's also what we drink. You know, Turkish society have a big problem. We don't drink enough water. National Academy of Medicine says, uh, you know, uh, recommends up to eleven or for female and sixteen for men, like like two liters. I mean, you don't need to wait until you get thirsty to drink water. People think they drink enough. But if you don't calc if you don't count, you, you never reach your two liter goal. So it's important to count your water intake, and and you can test this what you with testing your urine. If it is light color, that means you are healthy. But if it is has darker color, you are not. It should be a habit for all of us. For COVID nineteen positive cases. Uh, Water intake is even more essential because with diarrhea and, and other uh, symptoms, the need for water intake increases. You know, we have uh, we are lucky in Turkey that we have black tea, and we, we can, but we can also drink green tea or white tea. A minimum two glasses of tea, consuming two glasses of tea will improve immune system and then lentils and uh, you know ginger and cloves can be uh, brewed together to make a winter tea and how about your your uh, your plate you know we know we want a rainbow color in your diet because there are different antioxidants in fruits and vegetables every color has different uh, a variety of of nutrients it's it's miraculous so if it is green choose a darker green if it is reds you know oranges and purples should be on our diet and we may in, we may think about increasing our fruits and vegetables for you know you know, we, we need uh, two or three parts. Like, I mean, one part means like, you know, f a, you know, one handful, one handful of fruit or vegetables. If you think about the day, you know, you can have vegetable salads or you can have soups. You can add vegetables to your soup so that you, that you can improve your immune system. And then the fiber content, vitamin composition. And then also for antioxidant uh, content, we know which group of nutrients are immune system friendly. Uh, like for example, berries, if you can find raspberries and all other berries, grapefruit and and then parsley and then, you know, selatin also mentioned, you know, I mean, we don't have, uh, you know, clear diagnosis or, you know, proof yet, but, you know, apples, onions, they all uh, boost your immune system.
and oranges and tangerines and you can I mean you can add them to your salads you don't need to squeeze them you just you can just add them to your salad and then sulfur rich uh, lettuces you know broccoli and turnip they you must consume them and then pumpkin pumpkin and sweet potatoes and uh, s sweet uh, carrots or purple carrots can be used in our salads and uh, you know we can bake them we can have a, a, a veggie dish but you, vegetables should be half of our plate but I can, can should I enrich my um, veg veggies uh, with, uh, with uh, spices like tur turmeric uh, turmeric uh, is discussed a lot but to to give a boost to our body uh, we have so many uh, precious spices and if we could have them on our uh, dishes that would really give us health and then among them is the is the ginger you know uh, you know we, you may need to keep it in the in water for for a while you can like uh, add it, slice it, or you know, uh, add it to your uh, meals, and then peppers, you know, uh, and and I and and and I believe you know, pepper flakes uh, re replicate salt in in your in your uh, food, and then sage, you can make a sage tea, you can add it to your meals, and then mint. And then, and, and then, you know, you know, we we we can we can add you know certain certain herbs like black seed uh, to our peppers, black pepper, or you know you you, you know may, maybe you can mix the black seed uh, powder uh, with your uh, with your with your black pepper. You you know people buy it, uh, but then. They not not everybody uses them, and then after some time they, they forget and it may expire. So uh, to avoid waste, why not mix some of those black seeds with with with, with, with the black pepper and just just have it on your daily meals. Omega three resources, you know, other professors already thought about them. They they provide quality proteins and fats. Omega-3, uh, you know, modulates immune system. It also boosts your mental, mentally, you know, we are overloaded with stress. It gives you happiness, you know, fish, minimum two or three days a week should be on your, on our diet together with COVID-19. Uh, heart failures are increasing and boost supports of supplements of, of omega-3 will, will benefit all of us so try to reach two or three fish dishes a week and then everybody is asking me questions about hygiene you know unfortunately people were afraid of buying fish because of hygiene but I mean that that's that's that's about proper you know shopping and storage uh, ways. You can get uh, omega three from uh, plants as well, but uh, well you know you know you know walnuts, chia, uh, and they also you know maybe maybe you can have a salad with walnuts and and chia seeds uh, together. You know. You know all, all, all, all of these uh, you know when you when you take them regularly you know you shouldn't be eating you know uh, you know all of it in one in one set but instead just distribute it evenly have a nice breakfast have a balanced lunch and then continue with dinner and protein groups from different sources are also important because during the pandemic um, people are consuming more meat, but why not have chicken and fish and but not only animal proteins but herbal proteins like you can have lentils and you can have chickpeas as well. 
how how how about the fatty seeds? They are rich, like they had they contain zinc and selenium and vitamin E. Like in a handful of snack, we can also eat some of those fatty seeds, especially the you know when when our mood is disturbed. Maybe maybe eating uh, sunflower seeds uh, will add us improve the, the serotonin hormone and will give us happiness. Sunflower seeds, just just a handful, just a handful of sunflower seeds will be a good idea. Fermented food, you know, they are correlated with uh, the gut microbiota. Although we don't have you know clear evidence, you know, Turkish Turkish uh, people can eat you know yogurt, fermented pickles, and and boza the you know fer you know fer fermented sausages and and kefir. You know, try to have them uh, uh, plentiful in your diet. Also, in in the Mediterranean, you know, you can, you can add fermented food to Mediterranean diet uh, to further enrich it. And in recently, among you know dietary groups, uh, there are, there are some experts suggesting you know adding a different category and adding a category for fermented food for uh, to the diet map. So we discuss what should we eat. Let's talk about what we shouldn't do. So those were the do's, but what about the don'ts? For example, the, the, the sweets and you know trans uh, uh, fat, fat, fats and alcohol. We should refrain from them. You know, try to choose healthy snacks, calculate the total uh, calories, those carbonated beverages, they don't have a nutritious value. We should refrain from those colorful uh, sugary liquids. We should reduce the trans fats and we should avoid from smoking. How about popular diets? Uh, what is the role of Mediterranean diet and its relation with COVID-19? This is a study from 2020. Mediterranean diet uh, is on the you know is has its uh, has its antioxidant, an anti-inflammatory, and an and, and anti-thrombotic features. It has zinc, you know. You know, Mediterranean diet has more fish and more vegetables, and therefore it is rich in in many vitamins and zinc, and it is immune system friendly. You know, we need we need further studies to prove its benefits on COVID nineteen. But I love this physical activity on the very bottom and and socializing. You know that sense of belonging. You know, feeding our spirit, not just feeding our stomach, but you know, as we intake macro and micro nutrients, you know, socializing and act and physical activities also have great impact on our health. And in the renewed Mediterranean uh, diet, instead of wine, you know, kefir is also recommended. Or or or natural, pome sour pomegranate is also uh, rich in antioxidants, and water should be part essential part of it. And those are all proven elements. And in 2019, 41 popular diet uh, were analyzed, and according to U.S. report, Mediterranean diet was um, ranked number one. In that survey, and modified Mediterranean diet like Dash diet and Mind diet uh, f come next, and the ketogenic diet uh, ranks the last in this ranking. But then during pandemic, 
because people uh, go to bed late and then they wake up late and people uh, go for intermittent fasting because of their sleeping habits and they they find keto easier and therefore they choose it but luckily 17% of Turkish society assumes Mediterranean diets, which is good. But then as a Turkish society, Mediterranean diet also suits us, I mean, our lifestyle, and I believe it is. it has many more benefits, social benefits. As I said, certain diets and certain spices have been debated, you know, People were looking for a miracle to protect themselves against the pandemic. You know, they, they discussed many things, many spices, and for turmeric and its co connection with COVID-19, you know, it is antioxidant, antiviral, anti-diabetic, and anti-cancer. Uh, so it suppresses inflammation, and they said it can in it can inhibit the enzyme related with COVID-19, but we don't have proof yet. In, in the beginning, they said never use turmeric, but then, but then, that what that that false statement was corrected. But then it has been used for ages, and a number of studies confirmed that it's, it it has been efficacious uh, for. Uh, against many diseases and I believe turmeric will help either as a tea or as a spice if you can tolerate it. Sumac contains calic acid, it fights against virus and bacteria. It's like a food uh, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and a medicine food and sumac in Turkish society, you know, people use it very rarely when eating the pita bread, lahmacun. But sumac contains high antioxidants and it's immune system friendly. I mean, we, there are studies on its protect, protective nature against COVID. We, we need further proof, of course. But as a dietitian, I would recommend sumac, you know, unsalted sumac, you can grind it add it to your tea, you can eat it with your dolma or soup. When you cook it, it won't lose its efficacy. So you can add it to the f to the meal when cooking. <coughs> you know, in, in so so so maybe so maybe you can, you know mix uh, onion with sumac and it can improve the diet it'll be it'll be more digestive and will also give a boost to your immune system. So, so, so also you can mix sumac with olive oil at a night before and then consume it with your meal. Vitamin D has been discussed a lot. I don't want to say too much. But then, of course, we need further studies. But then we know that People hospitalized with COVID-19 diagnosis, they have, uh, they, they show vitamin D deficiency. A study by Mayo Clinic also says that people with reduced vitamin D level compared to regular people, they have a high risk of uh, getting infected by COVID-19. As a Turkish society, you know, I mean, we know that the vitamin D deficiency is widespread and I recommend that people should make tests on this and they can refer to their pay to their doctors for any potential supplements if your vitamin D level is low and if you have a, an acute respiratory disease problem the, the, the risk of death will be elevated <coughs> talking about vitamin C no, it increases uh, uh, the creation of white, uh, white blood cells. No, vitamin C has been discussed in many infections, flu, and, and other respiratory tract uh, problems. Vitamin C is a potent uh, antioxidant. Until today, 
you know, the studies that do not show any positive or negative result of vitamin C. And we say further studies are needed <coughs> in Italy, China, and in the States. In, uh, in certain hospitals, it was used in an IV form to the patients. But we, need, we still need further studies for vitamin C. How about garlic? Garlic is commonly used in the Turkish society. It, it adds flavor. And this is a COVID-19 specific study. And they, they said it can be efficacious uh, to COVID-19, but it, it was performed on digitally. So we need in vitro and in vivo studies. So onion and garlic, they are rich uh, in terms of these uh, antiviral material and they also slow down the attachment of the virus. So garlic, consume garlic as much as you can. Well, you don't need to have a garlic peel. Better to, you know, <clears throat> smash it and then use it like a you know, yogurt with the garlic it can be used or you can add it to your uh, meals there are so many studies about garlic not necessarily COVID and garlic but garlic and in November 2019 this study says that garlic uh, helps the body to, to prevent uh, the attachment of viruses and also you know, it, it prevents their, you know, replication in the body. But, I mean, there are, of course, informatory statements by World Health Organization, which says they are good in terms of nutrition, but we don't have any evidence, any no evidence yet for their efficacy on COVID-19. How about uh, the rest time? Sleep and immunity. If you are sleeping less than five hours, the risk of cardiovascular diseases will increase. And the risk of flu increases by 4% and the obesity increases by 50%. Because if you don't sleep enough, you cannot control your appetite and your stress hormone level will be higher and your entire day will be on a lower energy and lower efficiency. And it also kills your immune system so over exercising and under resting is a stress factor on the immune system so please pay attention to the duration and quality of sleep we need to increase our daily physical activity at least 150 minutes of a week if it becomes a habit you can continue it reduces stress hormones you know, controlling appetite are all uh, very good when it comes to sleep. But then when you're at home, you should increase your physical activity. Feed your spirit, reduce your stress, and think about your spiritual self. I'm sure you have experience when you are under stress and when you are unhappy, all of a sudden you can get a cold. It's not a coincidence because your immune system is down. So please, to manage your stress, give little uh, breaks and uh, try meditation if possible. And be aware of what you're eating. It's not what you eat, it's also how you eat. You need to think about you know, uh, eating exercises. Where we eat should be calm and silent. You, you need to know how to give short breaks but then when we're eating sometimes we eat too fast so I suggest that you stop take a breath and be aware of your every bite so it's not only what you eat but it's also how you eat and eat with whom that is good for your uh, immune system and your for or, or overall well-being well thank you very much for your kind attention thank you very much for having me I wish you a healthy uh, life with your beloved ones. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor.
for this beautiful presentation. Thanks to you. Now we have a short uh, break. We have listened to our experts in our morning, morning session. And now it's our turn. Uh, so after these presentations, we will have a healthy and balanced lunch. We will start our program again at 1.30 p.m. with our speaker from uh, Akdeniz University, Irfan Erolo, Erol. So uh, we would like to thank you for your presence and your participation in our conference. Thank you very much and hope to see you back at 1.30 p.m. Thank you.
we would like to welcome you to our afternoon session of our nutrition and communication conference. So we had a lunch break and during our second session, our program will continue with other eminent speakers and experts from our field. Our first speaker uh, is another eminent professor from Akdeniz University Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Deniz, Professor Irfan Erol. Between 2012 and 2016, uh, she worked for the Ministry of Food and Animal Husbandry and carried out a number of projects in the field. So without further ado, let me hand over to our speaker. Well, thank you very much for your introduction and for your invitation. This is uh, really a very uh, important program. Uh, COVID-19 is now a global uh, pandemic um, and it affects the whole world. So uh, within that uh, perspective, the subject I will be talking about will be on viral food infections and COVID-19 and how significant they are in terms of food safety and public health. Food safety is our key uh, concept. Together with the World Health Organization and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Institution Committee of Experts, well, these are great authorities in these uh, fields. So, uh, in all uh, phases of this food safety, we need to be focusing on producing food uh, safely in a secure manner and we need to take uh, hygienic uh, precautions. Food safety and public health complement one another. I mean, uh, you cannot have food safety uh, without public health and uh, otherwise public health can only be uh, instated through food uh, safety. So what we will be trying to do mostly today and tomorrow, we'll be focusing on these areas. Move forward, please. Well, this is a very classical uh, definition. So I have modified it a bit and I have been using this uh, for some time now. All individuals in the world uh, need, I mean, uh, physically and emotionally and uh, spiritually, they need to uh, develop in a healthy manner. And for this to happen, they need to have sufficient nutrition on a daily basis and they need to uh, have access to clean water. This is a fundamental human right. And together with the pandemic, all throughout the world, for about one billion people suffer uh, from hidden or explicit hunger. Or um, no matter, uh, most of them are in the sub-Saharan region in Africa. So explicit uh, hunger is a great problem, but hidden hunger, on the other hand, in uh, developing and developed countries, stand out as an important problem. So together with this, uh, I mean, we are talking about hunger and other nutritional problems. So uh, in most of the uh, countries, in, in most of the uh, developing countries, and in uh, children below the age of five and six, um, these infections cause uh, for about 2 million uh, people uh, losing their lives on a yearly basis. So today we will be talking about uh, a number of zoologic uh, diseases. I mean, uh, diseases transmitted from animals to human beings. Next slide, please. So here, from a terminological perspective, Zoonotic uh, diseases are uh, important because they uh, threaten humanity. So uh, for about 60% of the pathogens uh, we see in the world are zoonotic pathogens. When these affect uh, human beings, they are transmitted to human beings uh, directly from animals or through um, animal uh, products. So thinking about these diseases, these zoonotic diseases, for about three-fourths uh, uh, of them, I mean, for about 75% of them are uh, new or uh, re, I mean, old 
diseases, but w which have become important again. These are zoonotic uh, diseases. So this chart reflects the reality in the world. I mean, uh, diseases transmitted to humans through animals. So all around the world on a rational uh, basis, it's very high. We have very high rates. These are uh, emerging or re-emerging uh, diseases. What do we mean? Emerging uh, diseases Uh, stands out as a mutation, a change of, of, of, of a disease causing a virus. Uh, I mean, in some sequences of proteins, I mean, these are small scale uh, changes, but they might result in big uh, changes in the course of this disease. So uh, host, vector and pathogen virulence uh, changes are also observed. So I, uh, otherwise the host, um, changes in one way or the vectors causing the disease change or uh, the uh, disease, the virus might have uh, an even greater risk or we might be talking about a pathogen that we, we did not have uh, before. So in a minute we will be talking about it in detail. So these are uh, pathogens uh, which are emerging. In the second group, I mean in the re-emerging uh, diseases, there are a number of compound of factors like uh, geographical changes and the widening of the host uh, mass, the interaction be be becoming more frequent or a serious uh, increase uh, in the incidence of the disease. In the 1960s and uh, 50s, for example, we, we had a great uh, pandemic of tuberculosis, but together with the antibiotics, it was controlled. But uh, this is now uh, turning into an important health uh, problem again. So in the coming uh, days, uh, perhaps one of the most frequent diseases we will have to tackle with will be these re-emerging diseases in the second group. Let's move on, please. If you, we look at the global perspective on a global scale, I mean, um, the re-emerging infectious diseases might be seen in all the continents, almost in all the continents. So it's, uh, we, we, we talk about a widespread there, bacterial diseases, uh, cancerous diseases, viral diseases. And in the uh, near future, we had uh, other important pandemics uh, affecting humanity. So there is no need to mention uh, them uh, separately. So the human humanity is confronting such a serious and dire outcome. And most probably in the future, we will be talking about new diseases and new uh, pandemics. This is one of our most important anticipations for the future. If you look at these new viral diseases, The uh, coronaviruses uh, have been pioneered by SARS and MERS. They are important disease factors which come from uh, this. And the bird uh, it flu. So most of these diseases, if you look at the last 10 to 20 years, these are new diseases. So in the coming periods, most uh, probably, these uh, re-emerging diseases will continue to pose a threat for us. So this chart uh, lays bare some facts. Uh, if you remember, uh, between, I mean, 24 and 2006, we had the bird flu, the H1N1 influenza, 
it affected all the world until those uh, years, until the 2000s. This was not a known uh, disease. We we have seen it in uh, chicken. So it was a disease uh, for birds. So most probably it it it it went through a kind of mutation and started affecting people. So these emerging or re-emerging diseases, well, this is perhaps one of the most important uh, examples in this group. And here we see H5N1 influenza. You see uh, the uh, number of cases globally, the casualties. Uh, So this disease has not been eradicated. So from time to time, we see it uh, regionally. Next, please. So we are confronted with such a fact, actually. So important diseases uh, come out. Uh, some new diseases uh, are emerging. And most uh, important part of these uh, diseases are viral diseases. So we see that viral diseases are in the foreground and we should ask why. Actually, uh, are we talking about a combination of factors? So in the world, all around the world, we need to acknowledge this rapid increase uh, of population. If you look at the world, well, uh, we are talking about a population of for about 7.5 billion people and our 2050 projection is that we will have a population of almost 10 billion or 9 billion people. And secondly, uh, the world is getting uh, globalized. We, we still have globalization in its rapid uh, form. So that means higher levels of consumption, tourism and uh, trade activities are increasing which means viral diseases especially are more easily spread from one geographical location to another. So that uh, speeds up the infection uh, rate. And from that perspective, demographic changes, uh, I mean, starting with uh, rapid urbanization play an important role as well. Changes in climate and in relation to climate change, especially uh, vector-based diseases, uh, are seen in certain areas affected by climate change more frequently. And some diseases are seen in, in, in certain geographies where we did not have that disease at all before. And uh, the relationality between uh, human beings and wildlife has increased. And that increase between the relationality of human beings and wildlife has also resulted in such diseases. We have bats, for example, transmitting various diseases. And in the wildlife, we have numerous words. So when we talk about wildlife and, uh, and some microorganisms living in the habitats of those wildlife uh, might be related to human beings uh, due to these uh, factors. So this is an ever increasing potential for these diseases to get spread from uh, to th these resources to all around the world. And in addition to that, microbiotal adaptation, uh, I mean, and mutations, most of these uh, diseases I mean, uh, numerous microorganisms have to adapt to changing geographies and they go through a kind of mutation. So as the case is in the bird flu and in the coronavirus, these affect the world population, the pandemic, uh, for example. And in addition to that, uh, we might be confronted with an international crisis on our economies and, and, and uh, in, in respective cities around the world. So from that general perspective, uh, let's move on to the coronaviruses. Actually, uh, coronaviruses, these are already known viruses. We have uh, different versions, alpha, beta and delta and gamma uh, versions. 
And amongst these subcategories, we have them in different animal categories. We have those subcategories. In the alpha group, for example, in dogs, coronavirus results in diarrhea. So others are in the beta group. So we have a wider spectrum here. So it covers a man, uh, cattle, human beings, uh, mice, and rats. These uh, SARS, MERS, SARS COVID 2, COVID 19 is between rats and uh, man, rats and human beings. And again, uh, the uh, HKU1, the cattle coronavirus. So from an original perspective, most of them are from uh, bats. So it's from bats to animals and then to uh, human beings. The uh, gamma sub category uh, affects uh, winged animals mostly. So in the gamma uh, version, uh, like whales, and it causes uh, infectious bronchitis in chicken. It's a respiratory disease, uh, respiratory tract disease. So we see uh, this in uh, some of our animals. Uh, our uh, veterinary doctors know about them very well. And here, these uh, SARS, uh, MERS, and COVID-19. Let's have a closer look at their development. The SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. We know that it's from rats and it causes an infection in them. But uh, based on the mutation uh, in question, the prevalence and incidence increases and it spreads much quicker and turns into a threat because they cause uh, pandemics on a global scale. So here, SARS and MERS As I've said, these are all uh, zoonotic diseases. These viruses come from animals and then they can be transmitted to human beings. Uh, for example, uh, in SARS, we have the palm cat, uh, bat, palm cat and uh, man. And in MERS, we have it like from rats to camels and to human beings. This was first seen in 2002 in uh, China, and we have of rat, ca camel and man, uh, breaks out for about 10 years later than SARS, for about eight or, uh, I mean, seven or eight years later than uh, SARS. So we are in an interesting uh, process. MERS was first seen in 2012 in, the, in, in Saudi Arabia for the first time. So the number of people who have been affected is low, uh, but the mortality rate is uh, very high, So, which is for about 34.4%. Uh, SARS is about 10% and MERS is 34%. Uh, and thankfully, the mortality rate in Corona is much lower than this, but uh, the number of people affected by the virus is huge. All around the world, we have uh, a very high number of cases. And we see numerous uh, reports like how our uh, pets uh, are affected by COVID-19. Uh, two dogs in Hong Kong, a cat in Belgium, uh, and in, Ch in China, Wuhan, uh, and it recently, 
perhaps you have seen it in the media, in uh, different countries, in, in uh, people have started seeing this in uh, their uh, buffalo uh, farms, for example. And interestingly, last week in Greece, we have seen uh, COVID-19 in uh, buffalo farms, in two of those buffalo farms. Now, vaccination studies are going on. And in, in from another perspective, <clears throat> it might be transmitted uh, from buffaloes. So the world uh, needs to be alerted to this uh, new change. And we need to take some uh, precautions. This, this is a study about how COVID-19 is transmitted to our uh, pets. So animals we keep uh, at our homes. Whether uh, it is transmitted to dogs, uh, pigs, chicken and ducks weasels and cats uh, might get infected. The New England Journal of Medicine uh, has an article on this. Uh, it might be transmitted from one cat to another cat. So the studies we have on hand will show us uh, a lot more actually. So we will be uh, seeing the future uh, on a brighter uh, tone, in a clearer way. <coughs> So these uh, species barriers are, in a way, uh, trespassed, and the genomic uh, structure uh, might include new mutations. So this is an important data for vaccination uh, studies. This is the last uh, part. And one of them in Italy, next, and in some uh, sea products uh, imported from Spain uh, have come up with a COVID-19. So I'm trying to tell you this. We are working on these uh, important microorganisms, including viruses. We carry out our research and we, expert, uh, we, we preserve them in uh, like minus 85 degrees. So all these microorganisms are uh, alive. They keep their livelihood. So in uh, frozen uh, foods, these viruses uh, might be active. This is not a surprise. But of course, we need to take uh, precautions. So these critical diseases, uh, what about prevention and control? Where do we move? Where do we come from? And where are we heading towards? So how things will change in the future? Let me also talk about these issues and uh, finalize my presentation with these uh, concepts. When we talk about pr pr preserving, uh, I mean, prevention, we need to have a very uh, strict control from the farm to the field to the our tables. And secondly, we need to have epidemiolog epidemiologic uh, studies about the spread of the disease transmutation of the virus and uh, how things will be affected because it will affect our strategy and it will be a good opportunity for testing our strategy and including the vaccination. It's important for the research being carried out. And the hygiene of the personnel 
uh, I mean, production, processing and distribution. There are duties and responsibilities that need to be shouldered by producers and distributors like using masks and hygiene and cleaning materials. And we need to inform uh, our uh, people, I mean, from a professional perspective, the food processing uh, institutions and facilities, I mean, talking about the whole chain of production, everyone in this chain should be uh, tested for COVID-19 uh, and also for other food infections and for other food poisonings. That needs to be the fundamental basis for us so that we will be able to answer their needs. So within the framework of COVID-19, using masks is of primal importance. Cleaning and disinfection, so that has always been highlighted, especially uh, the 70% uh, base uh, alcohol disinfections, uh, disinfectants should be used. And physical uh, distance, social distance should be preserved. People working for these facilities need to be tested for their body temperature in the first place and then they should also be observed whether they have some respiratory symptoms or not and also the uh, training and uh, educating the consumers properly uh, consumers uh, should be aware of the fact that they should clean and wash their vegetables and fruits thoroughly they need to cook them well uh, so that uh, cross uh, spreading uh, in the kitchen will be prevented because this is very crucial. I mean, uh, most of these precautions uh, are not special to COVID-19. Uh, they are uh, general uh, precautions about food safety and all other food infections and specifications. But for COVID-19, well, uh, we are uh, more sensitive about it. We need to be more sensitive uh, about COVID-19. But one thing that needs to be known is that until today, we did not have an infection of COVID-19 through food or water. So our foods are posing no threat for a COVID-19 infection for us. Uh, so we need to be careful about our cleanliness and uh, disinfection and personal hygiene, of course. Let's move on, please. Of course, uh, this is our main issue about COVID-19. But along with this, this is not a direct uh, food uh, infection. So we have uh, some food uh, infections. This is an important group, actually. And they might cause a uh, large scale infection, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, noroviruses, avian influenza, tick borne encephalitis, polio virus, echovirus, astrovirus, uh, calico viruses, and rotaviruses are important. So it's important, uh, I mean, it's possible to increase these uh, numbers, but uh, these cause uh, infections in human beings. So let's move on, please. As you know, I mean, we have talked about it. There is no need to uh, repeat. They do not have a metabolism of their own. So they are in need of a host cell. So the host cell uh, has a metabolism of its own. They have their own energy resource for multiplication. So the viruses uh, have to use the host cell's uh, energy. So they have a different... Uh, structure. They do not have a cellular structure. So they have nucleic acids in both of them, but most uh, importantly, other microorganisms, the peptides uh, and uh, yeasts might multiply in food, but viruses cannot do that. So uh, if it's not a living creature, uh, viruses cannot multiply because they do not have a metabolism. So compared with COVID-19, until today, 
it's interesting that no uh, cases were reported and it, affect, it, it, it explains this situation. So, uh, people who get ill need to show active symptoms. So that uh, they need to uh, transmit a high number of particles into their environment. So this is not a very probable uh, situation. How it is infected? Mostly fecal and oral, the particles in, in the feces, or zoonotic uh, ways. Let's move on. These are the resources of infection. See uh, food, uh, vegetables and fruits uh, are in the foreground or water. So uh, fecal and uh, true fe faces to uh, water. And see uh, products. Um, I mean, like the Crustacean uh, seashells and uh, oysters, for example, uh, receive these viruses, but they don't get ill by these viruses. So if you consume them uh, in a raw way, uh, these viruses might be transmitted to human beings. Vegetables are important sources of infection, and unfortunately we have um, infrastructure problems in most of the countries around the world. So porter uh, individuals, those who carry the uh, virus, they, are, they might be working in restaurants and in kitchens, uh, especially in raw foods, the infection rate is much higher. Why are seafood uh, dangerous? Because uh, they are, uh, they have their shells uh, and they have uh, protection. This is not a consumption habit in Turkey, but especially in the United States, in Canada, in Australia and in uh, New Zealand. Uh, Chinese oyster is being uh, consumed in large uh, amounts so people can get infected uh, from these uh, seashell animals. Sometimes we know that the <coughs> heating will not be enough, so it is important to take hygienic measures for the consumption of food. And what do we need for protection? If there's a problem, like a contamination in a region, we have to prohibit uh, hunting or fishing of uh, shellfishes. <coughs> and then we, should, we, should, we, should, we must make sure that the drink, drink, drinkable waters are hygienic and clean. Personal care, self-hygiene are important. Um, porters uh, should be screened, and especially in, in the corporations. And for uh, risky uh, food groups, we should have screening tests on a regular basis. Well, that was my summary about COVID-19, uh, health, hygiene, and safety. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I greet you with all my respect.
We want to thank Professor Irfan Ernal for this beautiful speech and for the information he gave. Our next speaker is from Huan University. Uh, he is the head of the Center for Biological uh, Food Safety. For, for Professor Hans Korat Bizaski will speak. He will talk about the nutritional physiology and nutritional medicine. And I mean, he, he lectures on these uh, subjects in, in several medical faculties in Europe. He also chairs a number of international uh, lectures. He sent his uh, video recording yesterday from Germany to us. He will be airing his video. Let's, let's watch it. Welcome to all who are listening. And you may realize I'm a little bit suffering from a horse, but yesterday it was far more uh, less good. And unfortunately, we need to record that earlier because I have a long scheduled surgery on the 17th of November. Maybe I can be present for the last, last five minutes of the presentation. So the title uh, might be a little confusing, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic and vitamin D. And the question is what both have to do one with the other and whether there is some interesting aspect to, to have an adequate vitamin D status. So what I will try uh, to, to show you that a low vitamin D status is frequent in COVID-19 patients and in particular in the comorbidities, which are a special risk factor for severe COVID course, we find in many cases, a in poor vitamin D status. And the question is, what is adequate? How much do we need to have a good vitamin D status? And that brings me to a short aspect um, uh, of uh, yeah, how to give interpretation of requirement and what we really need. What is the requirement? The requirement is based on an estimation. And the estimation in particular for some vitamins is more than 20 years old. Estimation means we're taking a group of healthy adults and look how much they need that they do not get uh, any kind of vitamin deficiency. The basis of that is their diet. And we, from that, we do not really know the individual needs because we need the diet, we need comorbidities, age, etc. But the basis is, again, the estimated average requirement, which is used to develop general requirements. And if you look at a very recent uh, nutrition mapping project in the US, you will find that a couple of Americans are below the requirements for different vitamins and micronutrients. In particular for vitamin D, it's nearly 80%. For vitamin E, it's over 80. And if we look into Europe, we see that below the estimated average requirement, that's a minimum of what we need um, to, yeah, to have something like a more or less adequate status. Depends if we are below the 50 or higher of the 50% percentile. So you see that nearly 100% in Europe have a poor vitamin D status, in particularly elderly people. And I looked at data from Turkey, and there was just recently, half a year ago, or one year ago, a major analysis of all studies which were running in Turkey, and they figured out a nearly 60% or even higher percentage of vitamin D deficiency in Turkey, depending on gender, on age, on season, and on a couple of further aspects. So what does it mean? We know the consequences of a vitamin deficiency. It's a typical disease like scurvy in vitamin C deficiency or uh, serophthalmia in vitamin A deficiency. In case of vitamin D, it's rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. And what happens before the deficiency is visible when the supply is not sufficient? You see here the end stage disease of two different vitamins. It's niacin on the right side, uh, which is called pellagra, 
and its blindness due to um, the fact that the cornea is destroyed by inflammation in cases of vitamin deficient, vitamin A deficiency. And the question is, if that is an end state, what is before? And what do we really know what is before? So I try to give here a scheme, what we believe is of importance. If 100% of the requirement is achieved, you have an adequate supply. And if the supply declines, you're coming in an area where in the center is the estimated average requirement, what we call hidden hunger. Hidden hunger means there is a poor status, but no classical clinical signs because the classical deficiency signs occurs far more later, as you may see on the right side of the blue arrow. And we do not, in many cases, we do not have real biomarkers, for example, plasma levels, because vitamins are not regulated like pharmaceuticals on, on a dose response or anything like that. So it is not easy to detect the hidden hunger. And um, <clears throat> that brings that to the name hidden hunger, despite the fact that hidden hunger has a couple of consequences. And I will stay with vitamin D and show you that we overlook important aspects of in, during many years, even we have some ideas with that. So first of all, the combination of rickets and tuberculosis were the main cause of death in children at the beginning of the 20th century. And nobody knows that there might be a relationship between tuberculosis and vitamin D deficiency. The small child on the right side shows both signs of tuberculosis and typical rickets. And um, yeah, <clears throat> amazingly, my grandfather figured out that children in his hospital, this was a hospital for children uh, and also for, for adults uh, with diseases of the skeleton. And he figured out that those children who were sitting in the sun had a better chance to survive from rickets and from tuberculosis. And this was a sentence he wrote in a paper where he said, we, had, we are with artificial sunlight, the mercury quartz light. We were, they are as good as the sun in St. Moritz. And uh, uh, Thomas Mann in his book, The Sauberberg, uh, described that when the people were sitting in the sun and were cured from tuberculosis. And the question is now again, what is behind? What is hidden? Yeah, what don't we see? And nearly 100 years later, it was figured out that vitamin D is important to produce a specific defensine, an antibiotic called cathelicidine in the lung, which acts against tuberculosis. And you can see that the invading organism is recognized by vitamin D and vitamin D together with vitamin A. In most, in most cases, they work together on the genes, produces the casalicidines, which help to overcome tuberculosis. It's a typical example of hidden hunger. And therefore, we cannot say we know all, yeah? in particular also with, with corona. We have some aspects which are of interest and more and more are coming out. And this is indeed a challenge of the science during the pandemia that different scientists now working together. I'm working together with a group who is involved in virology. Others are working together in a group who are involved in epidemiology or in clinical settings. So the relation between vitamin D deficiency and tuberculosis is such an example, as I explained. So what's now with COVID-19? and the non-skeletal functions. Vitamin D, and we know that it's yeah, more or less 30 years, is a pro-hormone similar to steroid hormones and regulates hundreds of processes via interaction with our genes. And it's essential for the function of the immune system in a way that it controls the maturation and formation of various immune cells. Very short, you see on top of that picture, solar UVB radiation uh, results in the formation 
of vitamin D in our skin. And then this is transformed, I will not deepen that, transformed into the active compound of vitamin D. And you see on the left side is a macrophage, which is an important immune cell from our innate immune systems. And the green one, the T and B cells, which are important for the innate and uh, the adaptive immune system. And in both cases, you see that 125-OH uh, vitamin D3 together with the retinoid receptor controls the maturation and the function of these immune cells. So when the immune system is activated, it produces so-called pro-inflammatory substances, substances which destroy not only the virus, but in particular the cells where the virus has entered the cell. And that this will not become too strong. It is balanced by an anti-inflammatory effects. So like a balance. And we have the experience now that during severe COVID uh, uh, infections with the so-called cytokine storm and with the, the impairment of the lung and of, of oxygen saturation, we have a disbalance. So we have a higher pro-inflammatory response and a lower anti-inflammatory. And here comes vitamin D on stage. So let me first of all explain you the pro-inflammatory pathway which is involved and connected to the COVID-19 uh, uh, disease. It's the so-called renin-angiotensin system. And amazingly, that is a system which only 10 years ago was only in the focus of those who are working with hypertension. But 10 years ago, they, they, they, they found out that's also involved in inflammation. So after <clears throat> the angiotensin again coming from the liver has been cleaved by ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, it interacts with the receptor and induces a couple of things, lowers blood pressure, et cetera, but also induces a pro-inflammatory response. And the balance between the both is achieved by a counter-regular pathway, which has been detected yeah, around 10 years ago by the, the, the, the documentation that there is another converting enzyme, the ACE2. And if angiotensin 2, you see on the arrow and 1, are going through this ACE, they form anti-inflammatory. Uh, responses. So there's what we call the counter-regulatory pathway. That's a system is, sorry, <coughs> that the system is continuously balanced. And now the virus comes on stage. And what he is doing, this balance the system. The virus enters our cells via this ACE2 receptor, first of all, and then he down-regulates the ACE2 receptor, so that angiotensin 1 and 2 can't go through and activate the anti-inflammatory response. So angiotensin 2 increases, and that results in an activation of another pro-inflammatory pathway, not only that of the classical pathway. This is a transcription factor for cytokines. The nf kappa b is again activated. And just to mention, um, that is one reason and one important reason for the cytokine storm. So it was now elucidated that vitamin D can upregulate ACE2. Indeed, it has been shown that if you supplement vitamin D in experimental conditions, um, then you can see an upregulation of ACE2. And you also see it in cases where an inflammatory lung, lung disease was induced. So it's an interesting aspect that by upregulation of the ATE2, there might be a higher flow of angiotensin ions and uh, one and two, and a better counter-regulatory pathway. But that's not the whole story. The whole story is that vitamin D, and that has been evaluated five years ago, 
downregulates renin. Renin is important to form angiotensin 1 from angiotensinogen. And then you have a lower amount of both compounds, angiotensin 1 and 2. You have a higher ACE2, and that might help, again, to counter-regulate and to balance the whole system. So the question is now, um, again, if we want to balance the system, we need to know uh, who is at risk for vitamin D deficiency. For me, it makes no sense to say, okay, let's all guys take vitamin D and that way we protect them. That's, that's not the way we should go. But we know that a low vitamin A status is often found in the corona critical comorbidities, in high blood pressures, in diabetes, in a body mass index higher than 35. That is of particular importance because <clears throat> a high amount of fat tissue in the womb, the visceral fat tissue, is pro-inflammatory. Again, and that is, may help or may uh, uh, induce a cytokine storm. Also cardiovascular diseases show low levels of vitamin D. We do not know whether this is an association, whether this is a higher demand, or whether this has any causalities. But predominantly, and that is of importance, vitamin, poor vitamin D status occurs in people aged over 65 or even over 60 because the skin synthesis declines with age. So they are depending on acer on diet, or they are depending on uh, a supplement. I come back to that. So if we look at the comorbidities and severe COVID-19, it's evident that, again, age, male sex smokers have a slightly higher risk. The risk increases up to threefold in comorbidities. A very high risk is in chronic kidney disease. And a chronic kidney disease is one of the major reasons for an impaired vitamin D status. The COPD, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a typical disease in heavy smokers, is also high risk because the lung is affected. And why cerebrovascular diseases uh, have a higher risk, we do at the moment not know. And if we look at independent prognostic factors, prognostic means when they enter the hospital to say, okay, there is a factor which might lead to a, yeah, a, a less good uh, outcome, that is age over 60, coronary heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. The highest is age over 60, followed by cardiovascular diseases. So the comorbidities increase the risk. And the question is, what is the role of the occurrence of vitamin D deficiency? I think vitamin D plays an important role. I think an adequate status plays an important role. And it just makes sense to, to correct that status to get the balance back onto the immune system. What do we have for sources? The major source from the diet is fat fish, salmon or herring. You need, an hour, you need approximately 150 to 200 grams per day or more. The problem, it's expensive and becomes increasingly scarce. Another important source are sun-dried mushrooms. There are some countries, they use sun-dried mushrooms to improve vitamin D status because the mushroom reacts like the human skin. The mushroom has a pre-vitamin D, and if the sun is exposed to the mushroom, then the vitamin, regular vitamin D is formed. But finally, most important is sun exposure during summertime. During wintertime, also in your country and in northern latitudes, the vitamin D deficiency increases due to inadequate sun exposure. So let me now have a look on, on some data. The threshold values for determination of vitamin D status, and if you look at sufficient, depending on the society, is either higher than 50, and most societies and researchers say it would be better higher than 75 nanomole per liter. 
if it's moderate or even severe, then we need higher doses to compensate that. If it's mild, maybe normal doses, I'll come back to that, normal doses will be sufficient. So what are high doses, what are normal doses? The Institute of Medicine of the US uh, states that below 60 years, 600 units per day would be adequate if the status is below 50 or below 75. Over 70, 70 years, it should be 800. In many cases, it's recommended 1,000 per day. The endocrine society goes another way. They say if we are below 30 nanomole, then we need up to 2,000 per day, and the vitamin D status should be controlled. In case of COVID, you do not have the time to control within two or three weeks. I think an early detection of the vitamin status and then a moderate to higher dose during treatment of the COVID uh, disease would be an adequate approach. Let me make a conclusion. We have ample evidence that a poor vitamin A status might be unfavorable for the infectivity and for the cause of COVID-19. In particular, those with comorbidities and age over 70. We should determine the vitamin D status, not to be sure that there is a poor status, but to see whether it's a moderate or severe deficiency. You can also recommend that people who don't go out, in particular during the lockdown, yeah, this is a special challenge. The people do not get enough to sun. They might have a low status. They can supplement 800 units or even 1,000 units on a daily basis. So I thank you for your attention, and I hope that I will have some time for discussion uh, in, in the uh, upcoming meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Dr. Hans Konrad Bizaski for this beautiful speech. It was eye-opening. This concludes the first day of our Nutrition and Healthy Life Conference. We had eminent professors on nutrition during pan pandemic and immune system. Tomorrow we will have the second day of our conference. We will talk about the fundamentals of uh, scientific, scientific journalism. And instead of, of scientists from, from medicine, we will have professionals of communication and media. We would like to see you tomorrow. Thank you very much to all the panelists. And we also want to thank you for your time and kind attention. Stay healthy uh, and safe away from Corona. See you tomorrow.